Good evening. Uh, today is June 12th, 2014. This is the Arlington School Committee. We're going to do things a little bit out of order. I'm going to invite the superintendent, uh, Kathleen Bodie, and uh, Chief Ryan to come forward. They're going to give us an update on uh, what's happened in the past week. Thank you for coming. Good evening. I don't usually get to sit here. This is. <laughs> well, this evening I want to give you a brief um, update on the Stratton situation last week. Not that you're not aware of that. But I just want to go over just the overview of the main facts of the situation. And, uh, and, the, and the chief, Chief Ryan, will also talk about a, a couple of decisions that the police department made and then open it up for any questions that you might have. All right. So last Wednesday, June 4th, there was a, a very unsettling incident at Stratton after school between a parent who was very angry and Principal Hannah. During the incident, the parent removed his Massachusetts license to carry firearms from his wallet and made references to owning and carrying firearms. At no time, however, was a threat implied either implicitly or explicitly made about the school, faculty, or students. Sometime after that, that evening, Mr. Hanna contacted me, our school resource officer, and, the court, and our court liaison and to discuss the situation. The next day, the police, this, this matter was referred to the police, and the police met with the parent. A decision was made to issue the parent a no trespassing order until July 1. Everything that was done in response to this incident was done to protect the safety of our students, faculty, and staff. And we did not believe then or now that there was a threat to the, to the safety of any of them. Sometime Thursday evening, a person in the Stratton community sent to the advocate a link to the parents' rap video and blog, which became known to all media outlets late on Friday afternoon. At this point, there was the next, the next part of this happened Friday morning or Friday sometime during the day, and I'll ask Chief Ryan if he could just speak a little bit to what the decision was on the police's part um, in, response to, um, in response to this. Thank you, Dr. Bode. Uh, and I should point out that I'm, I'm here with our school resource officer, Steve Porcello, as well. Um, and so uh, uh, Friday, uh, um, we made some decisions relative to this um, individual and his authority to have a, a license to carry firearms. Uh, by way of background, under Massachusetts law, there's a, uh, an element of the statute that um, gives the police chief some discretion, and it's in the uh, suitability uh, section. And we decided that based on what we learned um, uh, about what had occurred at Stratton, uh, as well as um, some of the inf other information that had uh, been made available to us about uh, the conduct of this individual. That, uh, I felt uh, at that point um, that he uh, was not a suitable person to uh, possess a firearm, so we promptly uh, relieved him of his uh, license to carry a firearm uh, as well as uh, the firearm that he had in his, in his custody. Mm -hmm. uh, a criticism of the school department is that the parents found out about the events through the media, which we agree is a valid criticism and should not have happened. The steps that we're going to take so that this lapse will not occur again is that we'll be reviewing our protocols about when parents should be contacted about events in schools as well as our contact protocols in central office. Uh, a complicating factor on that Friday was that I was out of state um, the assistant superintendent was impaneled for second day in jury duty, so there was no one in central office to respond to the media. And so we're going to ha have to have a little bit deeper um, contact protocols in central office for an event that hopefully will never happen that had those kind of circumstances. 
So, so primarily those are sort of the facts of the situation. Um, I think that uh, in terms of the operational part of it, and from the point the incident happened until what happened on Thursday evening, it was handled appropriately. One of the, even though I, I'm saying we're going to be reviewing and we are going to be reviewing our protocols, um, parent notification is a very complicated thing because it involves issues of privacy and uh, appropriateness, and those are all become judgment issues. But an incident like this is a good time to reflect again, which we will be doing, on when, is it, when in what circumstances should we um, send notices home about any kind of activity in the schools that would be a, a cause for concern. Does anyone the committee have anything they would like to ask either of these individuals this time? Um, if I understand correctly, the decision about whether it was a threat or not a threat, the initial decision was with Mr. Hanna talking with you and then deciding that it merited talking to the police. Not, not saying it was a threat, but <clears throat> can you not hear me? I, I, every other word I was oh. getting. I'll try again. I was asking about when decisions were made about it being a threat versus not a threat. And if I'm under, <clears throat> understanding correctly, the initial decision was by Mr. Hanna talking with you and referring it to the police, not calling it a threat at that point, but um, feeling that it merited um, something, action by the police, or, or at least discussion with the police. And then after that, the next kind of level of decision was made by the police, and the assessment of the threat was by the police. That's correct. Is that That's correct? Cor That's correct. Um, okay. What transpired was totally inappropriate. As the chief has said, there are some things that you simply don't do. You don't yell fire in a theater. You don't yell bomb at an airport, and you certainly don't, you know, meant to talk about having guns in a school, especially when you're angry. Mm -hmm. it, it was totally inappropriate, and because it was inappropriate, and, and, and we sort of in our society today have certain things that kick in when people make those kind of comments, this is what happened. It meant that it needed to be referred to the police, which it was. That evening, uh, Mr. Hanna spoke with our school resource officer, and um, then there was contact with uh, the rest of the, with the chief as well. Do you want to make any comments about that? No, I, I think you know that sums it up. Um, we felt very strongly that um, you know I'd rather be criticized for erring on the side of caution for safety, which I welcome. Um, and when we learned about the facts, uh, we, we, as I said, we quickly uh, ensured that uh, this person didn't have access to his firearms anymore. We completed our investigation, and as you know, I put out a press release on, I'm losing track, it was a Friday that I put out, uh, a press release that we, we had sought criminal complaints for, the, for a criminal threat. Um, and, and there are, uh, there are valid reasons why we feel strongly that uh, this matter belongs in the criminal justice system okay. and before a neutral magistrate who can make decisions moving forward um, that are lawful and constitutional about whether this person um, has future uh, uh, criminal complaints against him or not. Yeah, I, just to clarify, I wasn't trying to question your judgment. It was just there has been concerns that <clears throat> the schools didn't appropriately assess the threat and I was trying to point out that we were going by the th the threat assessment of the police, we that going, and and that's going by the threat just, assessment of the that's, police. That's okay, correct. thank you. All set. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this time, I will go back to the. Uh, I would ask that we have a moment of silence for Mary Ronan, a member of the Town Finance Committee, John Greeley. Uh, who is the lead dispatcher for the Town of Arlington Police and Fire Departments, Mary I. Skidmore, mother of former school principal Charles Skidmore, and Margaret Driscoll, mother of Dr. Eileen Woods, Dallin principal, who have all passed away in the past week or so. Moment of silence, please.
Thank you. Today we had Staff Recognition Day, and I had the honor of going around to all the schools and uh, passing out flowers to teachers who have been in service to the district from ranging from 20 to 40 years. And uh, it was really a pleasure. I had three very proud principals who insisted I take a tour of their schools, which I truly enjoyed. Uh, I got to see things that I haven't seen in a long time. It's my first time through the new Pierce School, and it's almost 11 years old, so that was my <laughs> first time in there. It was really wonderful. Uh, this afternoon, we had uh, a continued staff recognition, for, again, for those teachers uh, that have been in service. Uh, for new teachers who have just reached professional teaching status, which is a milestone in education, and uh, to those staff members who have uh, made a decision to retire. And we, they're all going to be sorely missed in this uh, part, and uh, I would like on behalf of the committee to thank them all for their service to the town and to the children. Uh, at this moment, it seems tonight I'm going to have everything on my plate. We have some new art in the room. We're going to begin right over here. Uh, it's a display that was made after completing uh, a study of uh, Laura Numeroff. If you give a pig a party, we decorated balloons and ice cream cones. The balloons were created with watercolors and the ice cream cones were created with puff paint. And, oh, excuse me, thank you. These are all artwork from our preschool. Normally, I would have put this off until September, but they're our most important constitu constituents. They're going to be with us for the longest. Moving right down on the line here, we have uh, mouse shapes. They read about mouse shape, shapes. Fred Martin and Violet are on the run from the cat and hide in a pile of shapes. When the cat is gone, they begin to build things with shapes. The mouse point out differences with shapes and describe attributes of each shape. To the back of the room, our preschool com completed an author study of Eric Carle. One of the most popular books was Very Busy Spider. <laughs> As a follow-up of art activity, children constructed their own spiders with pre-cut materials. You'll notice <laughs> that only one spider has eight legs, but they all have two eyes. <laughs> Clearly, the goal of the activity is fun. Practice with glue and paper, participation in group activity. Moving over here, uh, Miss Amy's classroom, integrated preschool. We studied the ocean and read Commotion in the Ocean by Giles Andre. We followed up by doing an art activity where we created three different sea creatures, crabs, fish, and octopus. The activity was differentiated so that the children could complete parts of the activity independently. And our last piece right over here, the children in the preschool five used red, white, and blue paint to make beautiful July 4th prints. They used finger paint, shape stamps, textured rollers, and glitter created this wonderful summer fun pictures. I think they're exciting. They've added a lot to this room. Uh, right now, I would like to recognize our AEA president, Linda Hansen, who has joined us here. As the chairman of the school committee, I take this prerogative at this time to commend to the community, to the board, and to our superintendent, William McCarthy, the high school vice principal, for all his work, especially during the scholarship night and graduation. Uh, I think he, you, a lot of people don't see Bill McCarthy, but uh, he is a solid bulwark to our building. Okay, at this time, uh, we're going to have public participation. But before we start, I'd like to uh, just put a, a slight caveat. We've had two meetings at the Stratton School. Uh, several speakers are going to talk. Uh, some possibly from Stratton, other people are going to talk in other areas. Um, so let's just go with that. The first person, uh, the speaking is going to be uh, limited to three minutes. Just let you know up uh, ahead of time. Jane Morgan, please. Hello, my name is Jane Morgan. Um, I'm a parent of a Stratton first grader, and then I have identical twin sons who are gonna be kindergartners at Stratton in September, and then I have number four who is home with me. 
uh, and he's only one. So I'm going to be at this for quite some time. And I was planning on coming here tonight to speak to all of you about kindergarten at Stratton this afternoon. And we got an email from Dr. Bodie this afternoon saying that there would indeed be three kindergarten classes at Stratton next year. So I didn't need to come to talk to you about that. Um, it was already on the calendar at home that my husband was going to put all four kids to bed. So I couldn't, <laughs> I, I, I had to take the opportunity to come and say something because getting out of that is a rare occurrence. Um, so, anyway, I'm here. Um, I just, on behalf of myself and the rest of the parents who have been asking a lot of questions about this, I know you've heard a lot from us. Um, we have been really, the response has been very candid, very transparent, very um, timely, and we really have appreciated that. I understand that this time it looks like the numbers worked out for us, which is great. That doesn't always happen. Um, but we are very grateful to have heard about it in June as opposed to in August so that we can work, you know, to get our kids ready for kindergarten. And uh, my kids need, they have a lot of things they need to learn before September. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, so we really appreciate it. And um, so just wanted to thank you all for your time. We heard back from so many of you and uh, are just are grateful that we we really felt like we were heard and we understand you know the way that it worked out and we're, you know we're pleased that it it worked out the way we wanted it to but we felt very much like we were listened to throughout the process so anyway thank, thank you. you enjoy the night yeah, I, know. <laughs> Go out. Yeah. I recommend trist <laughs> think so jacqueline gagan i apologize if i mispronounce it i'm used to it sorry <laughs> I am Jacqueline Gagan, parent of a student at Stratton and Audison. I am also a teacher and academic administrator. As both a teacher and academic administrator, I am utterly appalled at the actions and more importantly, the inactions of the leadership of Arlington Public Schools the past week. I have already sent my longer statement to the school committee and I'm a co-signer on a letter that was published today in the Arlington Advocate. I am here tonight again to urge the school committee to undertake an independent external review of Arlington Public School leadership. Thank you for your consideration and your service to the community. Thank you. Naomi Alperin, I apologize. Um, I'm Naomi Alperin. I'm in the sixth grade at Audison Middle School, and my cluster got to pilot the park test, and we don't think that it should be used next year. First, the computer had glitches a few times throughout the test, and at times I was unable to type in my answers or use the calculator they provided. This was very distracting. My exa wait. Second, we all thought that the questions weren't straightforward enough. The format was very tricky and how they asked the questions. I'm a good student, I like being challenged, but I really don't think that it was challenging kids in the way that they were probably hoping they would. A lot of my fellow students described their experience as frustrating, aggravating, and annoying. And I know that the park is all about thinking and being challenged, but that doesn't mean that I should be spending several minutes trying to figure out what the directions are, and to me, that's not fair. We also came across some questions about material that was never taught to us or on the curriculum, and that feels very unfair. And a lot of uh, a lot of my classmates and I think it's extremely hard to concentrate on the computer screen for that long without your eyes hurting or getting bored, whereas for MCAS, you're flipping pages constantly to keep you alert. And overall, I know the park test probably has some good things that I'm not aware of, but being a student having to take the Tests, these are the things I noticed, and I would rather take the MCAS next year. And I made, and 50 students agreed, and I made a petition. So. Just give it to Karen right over right there. Over there. She'll make sure we all get a copy of it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excuse me, Naomi. Second, please. Could we ask that you forward? Um, Ms. Fitzgerald, a copy of your statement, too? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job. Rebecca Steinitz, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
So I do know Naomi, and I know that that's her only copy, so if once you make copies, if you could get it back to her, <laughs> that would be great. But she's not here for, I promise you, I did not have anything to do with that. <laughs> um, so, and Bill, I might go like seconds over three minutes, but I've tried so hard to go. <laughs> So I'm here tonight as an Arlington parent and as an educator who supports the Common Core, which I see improving student learning and understanding both in the urban schools where I work and in Arlington. That said, I am here this evening to urge you to stick with the MCAS next year rather than voluntarily adopting the park tests. I have four reasons for my position. First, I have seen little evidence that the park tests are effective assessments, and the park consortium will not release any data anytime soon to help me out. From looking closely at the practice tests, and I need to say I'm talking about ELA, which is my field, I believe the, <clears throat> I believe the questions are badly written and developmentally inappropriate, as I've said elsewhere, and I think many of you have read what else I've written about this. I also believe that the tests do not align to the standards, at least in my area of expertise writing, where the test doesn't address four out of 10 standards. While some say the tests will get better, at this point that's speculation and I have no interest in my child serving as a testing guinea pig. Second, moving to the park test will more than double the time most of our children spend testing in ELA and math. The MCAS usually takes four days, two for reading in March and two for math in May, although in fourth, seventh, and tenth grade, there's an extra day for the long composition. PARC involves nine days of testing, 11, uh, pardon me, five for um, performance tasks in ELA and ma math in March and April, and four more multiple choice in May. That's five extra days of testing and five fewer days of instruction. That's third graders testing for nine days. And I think most of us here have had third graders and know what that means. We will have to do this if Massachusetts adopts Park down the line, but why do it before we have to? Third, Massachusetts will not decide whether to adopt Park until fall 2015. So if we shift now, we may end up subjecting our teachers and students to multiple testing regimes. And I need to point out here that the Department of Education is making a highly biased and even unethical push for Park. They have offered an enormous bribe, telling districts that their test scores will be, quote, held harmless if they choose Park. This will make it very hard for districts with schools that are at risk not to choose PARC, which come fall 2015 will contribute to the impression that PARC is inevitable, which I, I think is what the department wants. Why is this unethical? Because Commissioner Mitchell Chester is the chair of PARC, which is a significant conflict of interest, and I'm, that's not my original point. What does it mean for Arlington? I think it means nothing. Our schools are not at risk, and we don't need to succumb to this bribe. Finally, it is not an overstatement to say that Park is a sinking ship. The consortium started out in 2010 with 23 states in the District of Columbia. With Arizona's withdrawal last week, 12 states and the district remain. Do we really want to be among the last survivors on that ship? One argument I have heard for moving to Park sooner is that because it is computer-based, it will reduce administrative burdens, shuffling paper, getting data, et cetera. That's reasonable, and there's no question that Massachusetts should and will move toward online testing. But is that a good enough reason to adopt a problematic test? The other argument I can come up with is that adopting the test early will give our students a chance to practice the tests in case Massachusetts <clears throat> adopts Park in 2015. But if we have confidence in our Arlington teachers, which I do, we can be confident that our students will be prepared for whatever tests they encounter. And I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time. <coughs> Ms. Hanson. Hi, good evening, everybody. Linda Hanson, president of the Arlington Education Association. And I uh, attended a policies and procedures meeting earlier this week on this topic of PARC versus MCAS. And I, I think what interests me about the topic really is this whole issue of standardized testing in general. So that's what I'm going to be addressing this evening. Um, and so standardized testing in general and the role it plays in the educational life of students in general, but more specifically in Arlington. So I began teaching in the late 80s, before state standards and before state-mandated standardized tests. 
I thought the advent of the state curriculum was a great idea. Put the best minds together and develop a comprehensive curriculum. Why should 350 school districts expend a huge amount of time and money developing their own district curricula? When the MCAS test came along a few years later, it was a quite a shock to educators who were not used to being held accountable for a test they didn't write and would not be scoring. It was also a big shift because for the first time, educators were being held accountable in a very public way for test results. The era of high stakes tests had begun. While it took a while for the test makers to get the reading levels, question types, and scoring issues sorted out, 20 years later, I think most educators feel like the MCAS is a pretty fair test. And it gives us a different kind of information than we get with our teacher-developed common assessments. I clearly remember, though, when the state reduced the number of testing sessions in both reading and math from three down to two. Reducing the testing load by a third helped a lot. It was that much less disruptive to the overall school schedule and took that much less time out of the school day and year to administer, and we still got the information we needed. From the outside, you might think about the testing load of one grade of students, be it two days or three days, but from the inside of a school where multiple grades are tested, it looks very different. It's not just the time to get all the kids to the bathroom, read the test administration manual, and proctor the test. It's also the time to rearrange the desks in the classroom, the disruption of pulling teaching assistants, reading teachers, and special educators away from their regular schedule to provide the individualized and small group accommodations that many students require. This disruption happens for every grade that is tested. So currently, for example, at an elementary school, the two days for reading and two days for math at each grade level add up to 12 days of disruption for grades three, four, and five. So that many days of disruption for the school climate and schedule with the addition of a long comp day for grade four and two science and engineering testing days for grade five. With the new wave of standards, we're experiencing a greatly increased interest on the part of the state for additional standardized testing not only in the form of the park assessment for grades three to 11, but also for students in the kindergarten through second grades. This week, kindergarten teachers are undergoing training to learn about a new state mandated assessment called the Teaching Stand Strategies Gold Assessment System. Altogether, there are nine areas of data collection and a combined 38 indicators that will eventually need to be documented for each child. We're starting small this year. I believe only two of these areas are going to be in play this year. But when you look at the whole picture, it's an awful lot of, of work. The state has taken a cue from the Federal Department of Education and decided to use the power of the purse, in this case, our state full day kindergarten grant allocation of $238,000 in Arlington to force districts to adopt this new system. Which leads me to my final point this evening. I started out by stating that I believe in the need for a statewide assessment to gauge how well our students are doing compared to a statewide sample. But I also believe that we should constantly strive to streamline the need to rearrange classrooms, pull out teachers from their normal roles, and disrupt the learning process. Testing is not teaching. I welcome this conversation because I think we need to have an analytical stance vis-a-vis -vis any mandate that takes up teacher and student time. Is it worth the trade-off? in time, our most precious resource? Does it give us information we don't otherwise have? Is this the only or best way to get this data? I will leave you with a final thought. Finland is no slouch when it comes to their relative placement on international benchmark assessments, often coming in at the head of the class. Do you know how many standardized assessments they have? Anybody? None. Zero. One. Exactly one. During their 12 years of public education, students are primarily assessed by teachers, teacher made tests that vary from one school to another. They use a national level sample based student assessment similar to the National Assessment of Education process, the NAEP, that have no stakes for students, teachers, or schools as the main means to inform policymakers and the public on Finland's school system and how the school system is performing. The only standardized external test is the National Matriculation Examination, a high stakes exam that determines college readiness and that all students are required to pass in order to graduate high school and enter university. Here are some sample essay topics from this final exam. Media is competing for audiences. What are the consequences? 
compare chlamydia and condyloma. <laughs> Glad I don't have to write on that one. <laughs> Design a study to find out how personality affects individuals' behavior on Facebook or other social media. Discuss the ethical considerations for that type of study. It's kind of fascinating. I'm not suggesting we adopt this system anytime soon, but I am suggesting that it is vitally important that we maintain a critical stance in regards to the amount and types of assessments the state is requiring. Teachers in Arlington are excited about the Common Core, but leery about the kind and number of new assessment demands. Let's proceed with caution. And I also want to say that Naomi is a great example, though, of opinion writing at its best, <laughs> petition writing about a cause you care about. So that's the Common Core in action. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Newman and uh, Ms. Feeney. Hello everyone. We're actually um, not here to talk about anything um, that's technically on the agenda. <clears throat> it being Staff Appreciation Week, we are here to recognize Kathleen Locklear's Lock dedication mm -hmm. as the um, special education chairperson and um, we are members of the uh, Parent Advisory Council, or CPAC as it's called. Mm -hmm. um, for the town and we just wanted to thank Kathleen and the district for all of your help helping to create effective policies for our special needs children and for working with families in the district. Um, you have a very dedicated staff and you've been a great leader for them and we really do appreciate all mm -hmm. of your work. Thank you. Well, I'm really glad I came tonight. <laughs> <laughs> ends our public participation. Right now, we, uh, I invite uh, Mr. Weathers to come forward uh, to discuss uh, the district determined measures and common assessments. Good luck with that. Let's just put it that way. We need you near a microphone. We need you near a microphone. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. I, I uh, welcome the opportunity to share some of the things we, we do in our classes and whatever. And um, hopefully I'll have a few images up there shortly. And so um, I'll just, I'll go quickly through the uh, plan of what we've been doing for our DDMs in science. The, our primary focus has been two areas. One um, has been to do pre and post tests on topical units uh, by either semester or yearly basis. And that's really just to kind of stay with the, the concrete content program. Uh, another focus is been, has been uh, the, our alignment with the common core uh, in the sense that we want to really foster the reading and writing and interpretation and communication skills that are important for science. So those are the two primary areas, but we really have um, tried, to, tried to explore out of the box as well. And that's what I was going to show you a couple of things uh, if, if, we, if it comes up. And um, again, I apologize for the uh, technical thing. I, I, just assume because I use my computer downstairs that it was plug and play, but uh, I, I don't use it up here very often. So um, let me just go through some of the things. In some of the things that we've done out of the box is, um, for example, in our chemistry sections, we we have instituted what's called a or the teachers have a chemical misconceptions inventory, because in our common <coughs> everyday lives we. We have all these misconceptions, all of us do, and, and they're really difficult to get rid of, and that's what the research tells us. And so we're really focusing on those. And so, um, for example, a question there would be, you can imagine here, instead of, the, of, of looking at a photo on a PowerPoint, we have a tea kettle, a glass tea kettle, and it's boiling. It's been boiling for a while, and you see the big bubbles emerging. And so one of the, one of the questions on the chemical inventory is, is what's in those bubbles? And, and the multiple choice questions are A, air, oxygen, ga B, oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, C, oxygen, D, water vapor, and E, heat. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do just for 10 seconds is form your own answer, <laughs> consult with your neighbor. This is what we do in our classes. We, we try to get the kids involved. And, and see if you agree with your neighbor's answer. I'm not going to ask you what your answer is. I'm just going to ask you if you agree with your neighbor. Air, oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen, water vapor, and heat. Okay, so here's a show of hands. If you agree with your neighbor, put your hands up. Okay. So there's, there's some disagreement and, um, well, it ends up that the correct answer is water vapor. That's what's in, okay. <laughs> so we would, we would tease this out a little bit more in a class by having the kids discuss what they, why they thought what they thought. And it couldn't be heat. Pardon? It couldn't be heat. <laughs> couldn't be heat. No, nope, couldn't be heat. So, so well, when, when, um, we, 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 get the kids, paper, we get the kids' <laughs> results. <laughs> well, we had a discussion about heat. Yeah. I want when, to tell you to show our work. When we get the kids' results, we see that there are um, some really um, different answers that they all have. For example, the, the most common answer there for the kids is B, which is oxygen and hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. It's water vapor. And uh, I'm sorry for the trouble, Karen. Um, and, and what we see then is like, for example, B has a 43% uh, choice rate, whereas D has a 32% choice rate, the correct answer, in the beginning. Okay, and then we test again after the unit where the kids would have learned that information, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, D comes up 85% of the time. But we test again at the end of the year and we find that it drops. Okay, that's that persistence of mis, uh, mis, the uh, misconceptions. Okay, so we're focusing on that kind of growth. The, uh, there, I'm sorry, great. So if you'll just forward ahead to, there's, there are the bubbles, there are the choices. One more, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one back, oh. 
I'm sorry. Uh, I, I hid one slide so that it wouldn't, I, I have it open here. But, so you can just, you can leave it there. We have it here. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so we're focusing on the growth of dispelling these misconceptions. So that's a little bit out of the box. Um, and then in another uh, area, we are, uh, some of our biology teachers started a, 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 an activity called Journal Club, where they, where they, it's not really a club, it's part of their classroom activities, and they, they, um, uh, they, they have the kids read scientific articles starting in fall, and then they have them read more, you know, and more thoroughly, and they tease them apart in class. What did the, what did the author mean by this statement? And, and, they, and they work with that. Then, uh, at the end of the year, what they're, what they're asked to do is <coughs> to pick a topic, find three original research articles on that topic, and then do a meta-analysis of all those three and then present it. So they have, to, they have to start to understand the language. They have, to, um, they have to be able to talk about it and articulate about it. And they have to um, uh, start, start to be able to present to other people about it. So we're looking at the growth of that. We, um, it culminates in this final project called the Biology Symposium, which just happened last week. It's just, and this is a, kind of a picture of it from afar. Because the, these, uh, there's a close-up picture on the bottom and a, a distant picture, although we really filled up the whole Red Gym. Because all of the biology students do this, every level, every academic level. And, and so the kids have to... Uh, to learn about the reading and writing, and that's one of the goals of this project. So we're, we're measuring their growth on this on a rubric, but we, um, we're, we're still teasing out that rubric. We're not totally satisfied with it, so we're, we have a lot of anecdotal information. If I had been able to use my computer, I have a little quick 60-second video of kids and their uh, attestation about what they learned about the language of science. And it's really amazing to hear them saying that it was like a foreign language. They really had to dig and dig and dig to learn how to do it. So one of our district determined measures is dealing with that. Um, another is, um, sorry, I'm going between two different things here, is a, um, in our ninth grade physical science, we, we give two of those uh, content-based testing uh, programs where we test the beginning of the year and then the end of the first semester, beginning of the first semester and the end of the uh, second semester and the end of the second semester, basically mechanics and waves. And so we're seeing how kids grow. Some of the teachers, uh, this is a measure of the growth. This is the growth. This is not the absolute score. So this, the numbers start around 78%, which is, which is really uh, attesting to the great background that our ninth graders get in their middle school. They already are quite familiar with some of those content areas, but they yet they still make a pretty significant growth from that 78% up to, you know, another 30% higher or 30 something percent. Uh, we're also teasing that information out. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is just a hand printed graph that a teacher made. This is question by question on those tests, so we can see the growth in each topical area. A lot of color coding. I, I deliberately fuzzed it so you couldn't see names and stuff like that. Um, but you can see there's a lot of color coding about which topical areas the kids grew in and which they didn't grow and which they need more growth in. And so that is, again, a district-determined measure for these teachers who are really kind of figuring out how to do it better. Um, and then one other, oh, let's see. Um, some of these slides I added. So I, I'm going to have to tell you about this next one. Um, it's, a, it's a program called Jognog, and we're using it in, um, in our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade technology program. It's a commercial program. But what it allows students to do is, is uh, answer questions based on uh, the topical areas. And they can go back to those questions. They do it at home. So it's sort of a little bit of a flipped classroom. And the kids get color-coded charts of how they've done. And it goes kind of like from red to yellow to green. And so you can see and the teacher can see 
how the progress of the student is moving along. I just got an email from the Jognog uh, producers, and they have a global competition. It's a, a friendly one, and it includes uh, 43 states and 11 countries, 400 and something school districts, and we rank 29th out of those 431. So we're, we're pretty happy. What, what the teachers get out of it is they see the growth of each individual kid, and they see the growth of, of the class as a whole or where the deficits are. So we're looking into using that a, a little bit more rather than just in the technology area. So, um, and then this final, uh, just an image here in, in our eighth grade, another example is um, claims evidence reasoning, the writing of claim of the process of making a claim based on evidence and then explaining your reasoning about why you made that claim. It's part of the, again, it's aligned with the Common Core and it's, you can see here in the very beginning of the year, the kids' claims and reasoning as it was presented is, is short, it's, it's unclear, and by the end they become articulate and, and I have some videos of these things that are awesome. These kids are talking for 10 minutes about what they saw in their experiment. So we're measuring that growth on a rubric as well. So um, without all the uh, fanfare, those are the, um, um, some of the examples. And, and from the materials that I sent you in the packet, you, know, you can see what each grade level is doing uh, all the way from from five through 12. And um, so we're excited about the things we're doing. We you know, can do some of them better and some of them will probably shift a little bit and um, it's all helping us to focus more and more on what the kids need. So I don't know if you have any questions for me. I'm happy to ans ask or answer anything. Anyone from the committee? Ms. Starks. Yeah. Um, so We've been talking already, we'll be talking more, MCAS, Park, Common Core. Maybe you can give us a little bit of how science fits into that because I know that... Uh, the science is coming a little later. Uh, yeah. the, the, the way the states and the, and the, the uh, federal uh, activities were going, the Common Core in ELA and math were developed earlier and, and um, so there, there were this focus on that which is certainly important. And, and we, we want to do our part in terms of uh, helping the kids to learn about the reading and writing of science as well. But, but now we have uh, uh, state frameworks. It's, they came out. They're only a draft, but they are assuring us that they're, only, they're not uh, approving them because there's so much on people's plates. They want to just wait a little bit. But they said it's really going to, the draft is going to be what we end up with in, in a year or two. So uh, we, have, we have stuff to rely on now. I, I, um, I'm eager to focus on this. We have a lot of elementary teachers that have so many things on their plates with, uh, you know, you can imagine with one elementary teacher having Common Core ELA and math, and now all of a sudden new set of science standards on their plate. So uh, we would really like to kind of get in motion to, to um, to focus on that and how the, all those three things come together, how, how uh, reading and writing can be done in science, how, how the two or three things can all overlap. Um, we probably need some help in that because the, uh, uh, we focus so much on math and ELA that we don't have the support at the elementary school right now. Uh, there are seven buildings and there are teachers that need to see examples and be worked with in terms of how, how, um, how to incorporate reading and writing into science and, and overlap some of those, those um, tasks that they have to do. So uh, and maybe in, in fall when the science uh, frameworks are, you know, we have even more time to talk about them and stuff like I could, uh, I'd love to come and show you in a 10 or 15 minute thing what they're all about now, what the new standards are. So That would be great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Yes, yes. This is a follow-up to a question I asked last week. Uh, these are the DDMs. Are, are you? Are there common assessments that, that are? Yes, these open? are these are all common as well. So yeah, we're same. Okay. yeah. Other right. Other than a couple of little glitches that we had, where there were some part-time people that couldn't be here at the right time, <coughs> but 
99% uh, uh, of the time, these are all, like for all of our ninth grade, all of the teachers teaching ninth grade are doing these same common assessments, and they are also the DDMs. So you're using common assessments and DDMs, they mean the same thing Interchangeably in for the most part, yes. Okay, thank I you. I think it's, a, it's, on our part, it's, it's an efficiency move. Uh, like there's, there's so many things on people's plates that if we don't mm -hmm. uh, make sure that we work smart on these things, it, we're going we're gonna to overburden the teachers and we're not going to focus as much. Let me, do, 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 people, um, do people feel, the, the staff, your teaching staff, they feel ownership over the DDMs? Do they feel that this is something that, that's, that they've, oh. had a, they've had a role in developing or they feel this has been put upon them by a new evaluation system? No, I, I, think, I think that's an... Um, an ongoing progression of their understanding. Of course, they're a little nervous at first. They're a little anxious about what is all this stuff coming up, you know, and, and what do we do with it? But uh, we've given them license to, you know, to say, you know, think of something that's going to be valuable for the kids and that you could actually accomplish. And uh, so in that sense, they've taken ownership of what they chose to do. You know, I didn't choose or, nor did the evaluation system choose the chemical inventory or the end of semester test for ninth grade or the claims evidence writing of the eighth grade. Those teachers taught that. They bought into that. And, and most of them now have said, gee, I want to do this even better next year. So that's kind of an indication. Because one of the things I, I, I've been kind of pushing for up here is that <clears throat> we, we frame all of this all of the mandates from the state, whatever they are, DDMs, evaluations, um, as, you know, this is okay, this is what the state of Massachusetts wants us to do. Okay, I get that. But we need to, we need to own it locally. We need to make it our own. And uh, we, we need to uh, nuance it and, and modify it so that it works for Arlington and our yes. staff. So, and so I just want, I'm just, I'm not in the classroom every day. I don't supervise you directly, so. <laughs> but I just want that's that's a sentiment that I have as one member of this body. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I think if we don't if we don't let our teachers have some ownership of that, they lose focus and and um, and it's going to be an iterative thing. And they're going to shift something and say, you know, oh, we didn't do that as well as we could have. Let's try it a different way. And and as long as they're buying into it uh, and choosing to do those things, I you know I think that'll come out as as, as uh, part of their passion for teaching, which I see a lot of around here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'm sorry for the glitch. No, sorry, Karen. Uh, we're now going to have a presentation on math. Uh, Kristen Silverman and Carolyn Gaffey, please. Let me just say, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, was gonna, I think so we're both saying they're going to say this. Right. Right. We're not mad. <laughs> Kirsten Silverman and Carolyn Gaffey are two of our math coaches at the elementary level. And um, uh, Matt Coleman, who is the director of math, could not be here this evening. Uh, so they are presenting the math overview yep. for DDMs. And DDMs, yes. All right. Thank All right. You. Thank you. All right. So I'll try to be Matt as best I can. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the DDMs from grades 1 through 12. Um, so some things that we wanted to take note of. Um, we tried to use the assessments that teachers were already using as DDMs. Um, and when possible, we automated it. So in K1 and 2, they're using the AMC Anywhere. Um, where the teachers ask students questions and then they can put the student's response directly into iPads. And so that gives us reports um, and they're using those assessments in grades one and two. Um, and then in grade four, we're, we're doing the DDM um, in a Google form. So again, the teachers are getting those scores directly from the iPads. We're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, and then we tried to be strategic too with the timing of them. So. This is really small print, but um, here are uh, different types of assessments. The DDMs mostly are on-demand um, and performance-based <coughs> assessments. Um, and the elementary ones are all constructed response, um, and some of the middle and high school ones are selected response. So in grade one, 
Um, in grades one through five, we focused on the major cluster standards when picking the topics that the DDMs would be on from the Common Core. So in grade one, we're doing the hiding assessment where students need to, um, they need to know their combinations up to 10. So what numbers add to five, what numbers add to six, what numbers add to seven, all the way up through 10. And so that's what the DDM is focused on. So students are giving the hiding assessment in the fall and then again in the spring and we're looking for student growth over that time. Um, originally first grade teachers were already giving this assessment in the spring, so we've just added giving it in the fall so they can see student growth. Um, in grade two, they're also using an AMC assessment that they were already using in the spring. So again, the second grade teachers are just adding the assessment in the fall. Um, and the second grade assessment is about two-digit addition and subtraction. So it's one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. The teacher asks students um, some addition subtraction. Again, the teacher can put those responses directly into the iPads and then it gives them nice reports makes it everybody easier for everybody to see. Um, in grade three, these are, uh, this is an assessment that the grade three teachers wrote. Um, students look at a six by four array and determine how many boxes there are. And then they're asked to write a, an equation based on that. I think that, so this is, this, what, this is done one-on-one -on -one with the student. It's also an interview. Um, and then, so these are the questions that the teacher asks, and then this is what the student sees, and then they're asked to write an equation. So this is focusing on their understanding of multiplication, so coming into third grade. Um, <clears throat> we don't expect students to have a lot of multiplication, and then hopefully by the end, they do. And this is the rubric. Um, so we piloted in grades three, four, and five, two DDMs this year. Um, which was a lot of work for a lot of people. Um, and our hope then was that teachers could pick which one they liked better. And so that's the process we've been going through this spring, sort of which one they liked better. Um, we didn't collect any of the data this year. It really was just a pilot. Um, in grade four, this is another DDM that teachers wrote. Um, and they're working on comparing fractions. So students are given a couple different fractions. I don't think I can click on the link, but um, to compare um, in each set, um, we're expecting them to use a different strategy when comparing fractions. So the first two fractions have a common denominator. The second two fractions, I think, have common numerators. And so it goes on, it gets more increasingly difficult. There are six different fractions that they have to compare. It gets increasingly difficult as they go through. And so teachers can see, depending on how far um, they're getting correct answers, sort of where they are um, on that. We tried to make the DDMs useful too, so we're showing student growth, but we, we also want it to be something that, you know, all fourth graders are working on, and so the teacher can have data that she can use in her classroom. Um, and the grade five DDM are fraction word problems, um, so they they're everything from addition, subtraction, to multiplication and division. So we piloted actually eight <laughs> fraction word problems, which everybody said took way too long. It was taking kids, <laughs> it was taking kids a long time, and so the teachers did not like it. So um, we're, next year, the, the fraction, there will only be four. And so we really picked the ones that teachers thought were most useful and what they were, they were getting a lot out of. If you have something to add, you can. Stop me. <laughs> um, so that's grades one through five, which I know the most about. Um, in grades six through 12, they're using five to six questions on their um, common assessments. Um, and I was looking at the grade seven, so they've picked a couple of topics to focus on, and they're giving a question on their beginning of year assessment on, let's say, adding mixed numbers, and then something on their mid-year assessment, and then comparing that way through the year. Um, in grades six through 12. That's what they're doing. I think that's it. <laughs> so I went through it really fast. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> Anyone on the committee? Mr. Pierce. Do any of these assessments come home for the children to work on at home or are they all administered in? These ones are all administered in school. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Mr. Kalman. I wanna uh, ask about the process of 
developing the DDMs. Yes. And, and then the process of kind of people uh, modifying their practice and improving their practice with yes. the results of the DDMs. Do, yes. are, do you convene teachers by grade level yes. in each school and across schools? Yes. So all, all in the seven elementary schools. All get, so tell me about that. How does that okay. work? You got, you so, got, so we started this work last summer. Um, and so over the summer, it's hard to get people to come and talk yeah. about math. Um, but the teachers that did come, sort of, they were the ones that developed the DDMs. Those were the, when the conversations began. Um, and then over the school year, when we were meeting, we meet by grade level, yeah. let's say, on a, a professional development day. Um, those were times that we had further conversations about the DDMs. Some teachers um, used the DDMs as um, data for their student growth goal in their evaluations this year. Um, so even though it was a pilot, they were already using the data. Um, and I think those teachers found the DDMs the, the most useful because it was changing their practice. Um, and they were the, also the ones, I think, that were able to talk about what changes would make it more effective. And after you field test the DDMs, do you modify them based on yeah. experience? Yeah, so we changed the fifth grade one. Um, and we were giving another one at fourth grade that the teachers didn't like because they didn't think it, it really gave them a lot of data. So we, we have changed them um, for next year. Um, I believe at all, except for <laughs> grades one and two, they were already giving the AMC assessments. All the other ones have been modified based on teacher response. And let's say, let's say a classroom in the fourth grade at one school is having success with the, the DDM. Students are, are getting it, they're advancing, uh, their the scores are good. Um, but in another classroom, that isn't happening. Does the teacher, is, it, is I don't run an elementary school, so I'm way out of my league here, but yeah. uh, <clears throat> is it possible for teachers to go and observe someone who's having success, or do they, do they talk, yes. or how does that, what happens? Um, well, What's I, the practice building after that? Well, luckily, you have math coaches, so that's uh -huh. where the math coach would step in. <laughs> Solves the problem, okay. It does. Then educate me on how that works. It okay. does, I think being, being in the schools and seeing those things happen, um, the math coaches meet weekly, and so we have those conversations, you know, these this group of fourth graders at this school is really struggling with this concept. Are you seeing that in your schools too? Oh yes, you know, my fourth graders are struggling with that too. Or, oh, this teacher is doing this really great thing. And then after having those conversations with us, we're able to then say, ask that teacher, will you come and present at this PD, this professional development workshop? And we've done that a couple times this year. And teachers really like hearing from other teachers, and I think having us in the buildings has allowed us to see the really great things that are already going on, sort of spread them across the district, because people don't, having seven elementary schools, people don't always know what is going on in each other's classrooms. Do you track the DDM data separately? I mean, we didn't track it this year because it was a pilot, and we didn't want anybody to feel like we were looking at it or using it for any evaluation tools, so we didn't track it this year, but next year it will be tracked separately because there, they're separate assessments. We're not giving them on the common assessment, so we'll have a unit, end of unit assessment that everybody will give, and then the DDMs are separate from that. Okay, now my favorite question, just to help me out. Do we do, in math, do we do DDMs and common assessments? Um, in the elementary schools, we are. Okay. We are cutting back on our common assessments. We're trying to make them short snapshots. And so next year, the beginning of year assessment will have four questions on it for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And so we, we're trying to make things short. We don't want kids sitting for long <coughs> assessments. And what we're realizing is as we're trying to sort of put all these things together in one place, we're making the assessments longer and longer, yeah. which are less useful. So we're trying to make them short snapshots so we really get down to what students understand, what they, they don't. used to be about 10 to 15 questions, so mm -hmm. we're really paring it down. Okay, yeah. and then you heard my whole thing about making teachers own it and all that stuff, so is that, that's a goal? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. good. What else are you going to say, right? What are you, yeah. You know? <laughs> no, no, we don't want anybody to own it. <laughs> okay. Did you want oh, yeah. well, I, I would just yeah. say that's yeah. been the reality yeah. for years. Okay. Uh, all of the assessments that have been used in the, at all levels are all teacher created. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Mr. Thielman already asked my good question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll ask <laughs> just a little one. What does AMC stand for? I knew somebody was going to ask me that, and I really don't know. Um, do, you re do you remember? Yeah. Um, is it the American I was like, Math? I should look American that up before Math I go Council. and I say it, but it's I American really. American Math Council, I think. Isn't it? Is concepts. it? I thought it was Math Concepts. Um, 
Right, it's but you. it's the Kathy Richardson. It's, it's a Kathy, Kathy Richardson, Richardson right. um, math curriculum that we use in the lower grades. It's called AMC, but I can't remember what the AMC stands for. Thank you. Here Sorry. it's American Math Competitions, but I don't think that no, that's, it, that's not it. Yeah. If you look it up with Kathy Richardson, Academy of Math Concepts. Or Academy. It might be Math Concepts. Yeah. It's something Math Concepts. Yeah. I can't remember what the A stands for though. That isn't going to make or break you. I want you to know. Math. Yeah, I, think it's, yeah. I think that's what it is. It's assessing math concepts. Assessing. That's it. Assessing math. Assessing math. Assessing math. Assessing math that's concepts. the A. Great. Thank you. The stock just went up. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Schleckman. Okay. Um, I'm listening to this cold. I haven't seen the assessments, and part of the problem is I am an elementary person. So, uh, to my ear, listening to this, it sounds like the DDMs are narrow and computational. Would you explain that the, why they're not? What do you mean by narrow and comp computational? That you're really only taking a couple of very narrow items out of the Common Core. That it's not. It, it, I, I'm say, I'm, the thing that I'm saying, looking at, is for a DDM to be successful, they need to be representative of the Common Core, the curriculum, of the grade and uh, represent, truly representative of student growth, so that if, you, if you're using a DDM to measure growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, it, net, it by necessity has to uh, represent uh, a year's growth, and so that it has to be a reliable and valid instrument to do that. Uh, and the, to my ear on the presentation, you're talking about uh, things that sounded like relatively small elements of uh, of a grade level curriculum and of of a computational manner. Okay. Uh, so that's that's what I'm hearing, and I'm hoping that's not accurate. And if and so that here's my invitation for an explanation uh, of the depth, richness, and association right. of uh, higher level thinking standards and the other things in the Common Core. So I'll start with the grade one in particular. So the in the grade one um, hiding assessment <coughs> AMC six. Mm -hmm. so Students are asked, I would say there are probably about 20 possible questions that mm -hmm. students can be asked. So the teacher starts with a number of counters in front of her, let's say five, and she says, I'm hiding, it, I'm hiding some counters, mm -hmm. I'm showing you two, how many am I hiding? So students in grade one, our expectation is that they're starting to learn the parts of the number. Mm -hmm. So our goal by the end of first grade is is students know up to, I would say, three, four, five, six, mm -hmm. and then 10 is a number that we want them to know the parts of. Mm -hmm. So they spend a lot of time in first grade working on this concept. Mm -hmm. It sounds to us like adults that th this is something really easy, but they spend a, a lot of their time on that. So the teacher will then move on and ask them if they're, they're able to do all the parts of five, she'll then go on and ask them the parts of six, the parts of seven, mm -hmm. up to the point where they can't answer anymore. So we're assessing basically what a child's, we call it a working number. So we identify what a child's working number is based on what number they can get up to knowing all the parts of. And then the teacher then can use that data in in the classroom to inform her instruction, she can make groups based on children's working numbers. So this group may be, they're all working with the number five, this group's all working with the number six, this group's all working with the number seven. So having that data at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. teachers can already differentiate their classrooms based on those working numbers. And then students work all year to work up to a higher number. So we're seeing the progress that they've made based on what their working number is at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. We do have kids that come in with working numbers at the beginning of the year, first grade, three and four, and leave at the end of first grade with working numbers of eight and 10, which is, that's huge growth. I mean, students need to have a lot of experiences in that first grade to to make that kind of gain. So it's, it does sound like parts of numbers. I mean, as an adult, I think it, it, it sounds like something that we expect kids to sort of memorize. But this, what we're really expecting them is to know the parts of the numbers. So you're piece. decomposing the numbers. So that as you're getting up into third grade, uh, can you give me a sense of exactly how the um, DDM is representing uh, 
the depth of the curriculum and the, right. uh, so in, and the year's growth. In third grade, our, our main goal in third grade really is to have kids understand multiplication. So they come in from second grade, they've done a little tiny work, little bit of work um, with arrays in second grade. But multiplication is the, the major cluster in third grade that we're expecting kids to know. So we start out by showing them the array, um, what's the equation you can write, and then the final question is, uh, can you write all, can you draw all the other arrays uh, with 24 boxes? So we're looking for the three by eight, the two, the two by 12, all the, all the other factor pairs basically with 24. Mm -hmm. So our expectation again at the beginning of the year is that kids may write um, four plus four plus four six times. They might write six plus six plus six four times. Um, and they may be able to draw one other array, maybe two, but definitely we wouldn't expect at the beginning of third grade for students to be able to draw all the other arrays with 24. Mm -hmm. At the end of third grade, again, the expectation is when they see an array after all this work that they've done all year, they see an array and they immediately think of multiplication. And hopefully they'll say six times four and four by six because they recognize that it is, it is the, the turnaround, we call it the turnaround fact. Um, and then they should then know also the other factor pairs of 24 and easily be able to draw the other rectangles with 24. Okay, and, and just my last question, which is totally irrelevant to, to what I just asked. You were talking about making sure that the uh, DDMs the, this year were not viewed as evaluative. You did this as research. Uh, this is a difficult concept. I know that we've worked in on this in Lowell in a long time, and it's taken a long time for everybody to feel comfortable with this. Uh, is the culture exist in, in, in our school department, where, whereas the coaches are really seen as a support stream rather than the evaluative stream which is coming out of the administration and the principals? Is, is that, do you, do you find that a working relationship? I think, I think I talked about this the last time I was here, but I think in the beginning of the year it was difficult because I think we, there's lots of changes. Mm -hmm. Everything sort of is changing at once. We have a new evaluation system, we have Common Core, we have possible changes in testing. I think everyone just is on edge. I mean, there's retail, there, there's just a lot going on in the district. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the beginning of the year, it was scary for people. They weren't sure why the coaches were there and they weren't sure mm -hmm. how we could be used. I think we are viewed extreme, extremely differently now. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has realized what can come from having somebody support you in your building and, and how great it is to be able to say, hey, you know, I'm really struggling with this concept. Can you help me or can you help my kids? Um, and so I think now we've definitely seen a shift. And I think, yeah. I think having the data for the DDMs this year just would have compounded all of those other things that are going on. So hopefully it'll be less scary going forward. And Tom Brady has a coach and I think that every <laughs> teacher deserves a coach. So, yeah. you know, it's something I think is important, and I'm glad you're doing this work. Thank you. I just want to interject one thing that yes. Krista didn't touch on, but if you caught it, many, many of these DDMs mm -hmm. are done on a performance-based assessment mm -hmm. between the teacher and the student, mm -hmm. and therefore you get a view into the mathematical processes, mm -hmm. which is the other part that I think you're alluding mm -hmm. to. So by having a conversation with the student and having the student be able, have to talk through the mathematics mm -hmm. as opposed to putting a compu you know, strictly putting a computation mm -hmm. on a piece of paper, I think you get a view into that part of the Yeah, that, that, well. that was a very important nuance that I picked up in listening to it. I'm glad you articulated it. It almost sounds like you're doing Fontas and Pinnell in math. Almost like that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pierce. I just note in grade one description of assessment, one-on-one -on -one interview with students. How does class size in the grade one impact that ability of the teacher to do this and perform this the way she wants to? It, make, it makes it difficult. It does. Yeah. It makes it difficult. Is there a sweet spot number where teachers seemingly <laughs> like to land? I don't think there's a low end. <laughs> there's no low end. No. Oh, there's no floor. Okay. One on one. Um, yeah. so memorization versus visual exp explanation. I noted when you were talking about the arrays that there was a, like another take on the, the, the facts. Like you're, yes. you're not acting, asking for strict memorization right. like some of us may have experienced. But in the elementary levels, we're talking about visual explanation of how they get there. Right. Is that a common core element as yes, well? Yes, absolutely. Okay. 
Yes, we're much more interested on having kids be able to use the rela related facts to get to. So I'm going to use 5 times 5 to help right. you get to 5 times 7. Absolutely. And is it helpful for math coaches to be teachers as well? And in, in your past lives, were you, are you teachers as well as? In my school? past life, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was a teacher. And I think it does, I think it does help. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Well. You're a teacher. OK. Uh, yeah. a teacher. OK. Thank you. All set? Thank you very much for taking the time and sharing all this information Thank with you. us. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you very much. This time, uh, <coughs> here will give us an in-depth, brief <coughs> assessment on special education. And, and her whole team is here. And sure. I would like to invite the Plus entire her. special ed team to come forward. Hmm? It's one person missing. Hmm. Your son, what? I guess I'll work. That's good. Oh. Public participation. I don't think Ian ever had it. She may have been gone by then. Oh no, I don't know. Coaches are new. Where are we? Here we are. Special education. Good evening. Um, I think that I've heard Bill say a brief, short, um, concise, um, whatever, about 22 times. So we'll do the best we can. Um, we're just really giving a short survey of our work this year um, and kind of linking it to some other. Um, I've been here for three years. This is going to be my last year in this position. But linking it to some of the other initiatives you've heard about and just kind of you know, really giving you some pictures of how things have turned out, some news about um, some of the other things that you know a lot about. So we'll get started, and we um, have a presentation up here that will help us move towards. Um, if you see the big picture of the presentation, we're kind of heading to the top of that hill, and we kind of do feel like we did climb a mountain during this period of time. So um, it's a little hill. It's not a mountain. So um, on the fundamental principles, I'm not going to read all of the items there. You certainly can read them. We did share them with you, and folks at home can take a look at them as well. Um, a couple of things I'd talk about is something that's been really important for us um, is that, and we'll talk about our, the model that we have for our administration, but trying to work with all of the town. Um, and trying not to respond just to the hot items that happen, but to be able in a very, you know, formative way, work with each of the schools in the district. And that's, I think, something we've been successful with. Probably one of the highlights on that slide is really thinking about a partnership with general education. That's one of the lessons that we've learned from working with in special education is Nothing works if we're not working together with general ed. If general ed's working, we're working better, and vice versa. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, we listed on here is compliance with regulations and procedures becoming routine and timely. So I have something really good and kind of big to report about that. Um, when I came here three years ago, we were all spending a lot of our time on our um, on a, a report that came from the state that highlighted all of the issues that we had. Um, and we spent a lot of the first year responding to that. We just had our revisit this year, this spring. And while the report isn't out, and we're all kind of really waiting for it, I've tried to move it along, but that didn't happen, we got excellent feedback from the state. Um, they really you know, gave us a real pep talk to say that we've really been working on systemic <laughs> issues, what was clear to them. And they have a very fascinating process, but what was clear to them was that we were working really on the things that really matter. Um, they look at precise data points and put it together. So I'm looking forward to a really good report that really makes all of us feel better about the state of special education in regard to compliance. And what that's really helped us do is move on to other issues. Um, we have it more ingrained. It's more part of what we do. Everybody's aware of the regulations. And we have practices that are really helping reinforce them on their own. 
Um, so going to our administrative structure, um, we have coordinators at each of the schools, and my job as special education director really does become one of leadership, and I did really appreciate the parents um, speaking about that tonight when they gave me those lovely flowers. Um, so, you know, we all do work together as a team, and I think we do a great job with that. I think the important thing is that we're also helping our staff out in the schools, and we have teams in each of the schools working together. Um, so it's been a real strength, and we think, you know, we really feel it should continue. Pro some of the points are that with, with coordinators at each of the building, we're able to have better oversight. We have more contact with teachers. People are more accessible to, um, to staff and, and students and parents as well. Um, and we're providing consistency. We've been able to really work on transition planning. That's probably the highlight I would talk about here. Um, and that's transition from preschool to kindergarten, um, from kindergarten to, to grade level expectations, from fifth grade to sixth grade. Um, and again, at eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, we also have been managing our, the needs of our out-of-district students um, really quite well and very differently. I think we all know those students much better because of the work that's been done in that regard. Um, so we do have uh, 1.5 team chairs for our out-of-district students, and those are um, both new positions since um, three years ago. 11% of our students now are out and out of district. Um, and one of the things that we use, um, one of the things that happens is that those team chairs come back, report a lot to us. We all know placements well. And we've learned a lot of lessons from the things that happen to support those students that have been unable to be supported adequately within the district and replicated some of those practices during that time. Um, and the, uh, so I think that the out-of-district work has really increased the awareness of the complexity of students' needs. Um, one of the highlights, to highlight some of the things that have really caught our attention, anxiety is, and, and emotional needs is something that, you know, it's not this district alone, it's all districts. It's been an enormous um, issue for us to respond to for students that really aren't able to access their, it, the education because of a level of anxiety, and it's generalized anxiety. It's not so much anxiety about school. Um, it's a great need, and I think we've developed um, protocols and methods to respond to it, and we've learned a lot from the students who you know, have been able to get through that issue and get back to school, and we'll continue to look at that. So you see a number of the complex student needs. Um, vision and hearing needs are, are increasing. Needs for connecting with homes and families and doing home training and doing home assessment and functional behavior assessment that help parents work with their students out of school as well as in school. I think those, those are really kind of dramatic things that we've been doing. So database decision makings, making, we do have data and that's everybody was interested in easy IEP it's working pretty well I actually wanted to share with you a really kind of mini piece of, of data work that's been done um, we sent all of our occupational therapists who are related service providers to a training last year and some of them came back this year and instituted action research based on that training and I'll pass this little book around um, just for you to take a look. So this was at Brackett School. Um, the OT um, did a little project. There was concern about, as it was kind of timely, because we've talked about concern about students being able to keyboard, and we've talked about students being, their handwriting kind of, because of the use of technology, iPads or whatever, handwriting being something that's of concern. OTs work a lot with fine motor and motor adaptive skills. So one of the, so the action research was, is there a way um, to not take a lot of time away from the curriculum, but try to do some focus on that? So this um, OT actually devised a project, and she did eight mini lessons in classrooms of about um, eight of them for about 20 minutes, went into the classroom, 
worked with a group while other groups were doing, focusing on something else. She did a pretest and a post test, and she found just in those eight minutes of calling attention to different elements of handwriting, there was a very, um, a very marked change in the student's attention. She sent that little booklet that will go around to you home for parents to know what they were doing. Um, and so she, her findings were, um, they were the same as the research that had been discussed at the mo meeting that they went to told them, just these mini lessons and mini attention to it really helped students and she saw the gains continue. So that's kind of a really you know, micro look at using data and then sharing it with her staff. I've recommended that they consider presenting. There's another project about sensory issues that was done at the Stratton School. So I've recommended that they present that to some other staff because it's a really simple way to kind of go back to a skill and we know that fine motor development, some of that helps children remember things if they're able to you know, write them in that way. So um, then our early childhood, great. Um, so, um, you know, I want to go back and introduce people because I meant to do that when we talked about our administrative structure. So I'm going to start with Ben Halfett. Sheila McCabe, Early Childhood Coordinator, and Jill Perkin, Elementary Coordinator. So I was just going to mention um, Sheila. We have this nice, um, uh, nice preschool art, and I thought we'd share something else and send it around. I figure at this point in the, you need some motivation. So this is a great little um, preschool book that one of the staff members shared with me that parents made to share with the teach. They did some interviews with students <coughs> in the, a certain classroom, and so it's kind of nice and to look at and kind of uh, perk you up about. Um, it's another way to look at what's happening at the preschool. There's been a lot of work <coughs> happening at the preschool. You'll see the bullet points up there. Um, probably the biggest thing that's happening is that there is much more collaboration at the preschool. Um, we're thinking together about restructuring. Um, we've made some changes and we're people just recently participated with the kindergarten in um, a common assessment program, the GOLD, which is going to be starting at the preschool as well as at the kindergarten. Um, so that'll be a common assessment they, they have, which opens a way to a lot of other things happening as far as curriculum goes. We're also um, going to be starting a mathematics curriculum, which is called Building Blocks, and it's an excellent preschool curriculum, and they're having training in that in the next few days, too. So um, those are just a few of the things that are happening, but there's a real coming together and, um, and actually it's really palpable. There's just lots of great things happening in our preschool. We should be really proud of it. Elementary. Um, you can see our bullet points up there. And um, probably what to concentrate on there is really our teams, the social workers, um, psychologists, team chair and principals. In each of the seven schools they meet weekly to go over um, any of the issues, they review students who are doing well, they review students who may need some other support, um, and then there's action that happens. Um, and some of that action is the RTI and the SST practice, the student support um, teams getting together and really planning for interventions. Um, this, I would, I, I don't want to single out schools because, and say it's not happening everywhere it is, but Thompson School has done a remarkable job with their RTI and SST process, and that's really been a model for our elementary schools. Um, and the secondary, we talked about the transition. Um, the specialized courses really geared to gaps. One of the things I'd talk about and highlight there is we hear a lot about executive function skills students not having a kind of the building blocks that they need to really function well in school. We've um, been able to, we have a project at the middle school um, with ILD, which is um, an organization, acronym, Institute for Learning and Development, which is funded by one of the Cummings um, grants. 
and they're working with us to develop a peer-to-peer -peer executive function program where we're training eighth grade students who then will help sixth grade students um, and they found in their research which is pretty much international research that that is one of the best ways to affect changes in executive function is to have children giving hints and tips to others along with obviously using a teacher um, the alternative program that's been opened as an Arlington High School um, site um, is another one of the things that's very, you know, working very well and you've heard more about the transition at other points during the year. Anything else you want me to comment on? So um, just looking forward, we're really moving from compliance, as I men mentioned, to high quality data driven comprehensive progress models. Um, I, I actually never am satisfied with quality. I'm never satisfied that we can't be doing better for students. We luckily have students who really challenge us to do better all the time. Um, so that's really the spirit of mo that we feel moving forward is to keep at it. Um, we learn more about students. The more we learn, the more we know that we really don't know and need to keep <coughs> finding out and moving forward. So that's the spirit. A focus on internal program quality is what we're really looking at. Um, we're looking at that at the preschool, as I mentioned. We're looking at it through grade 12 and in transitional services. Um, one of the things I think in, also in our supportive learning classrooms, that's an area that we're really looking at to look at uh, the modification of curriculum and the, the what kind of curriculum and practice can really assist the students who are in those programs. And um, the increase of collaboration and communication to all stakeholders, it's been really important to us. It's a value that we have. I don't think that, it, 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 you know, there, there probably are a few calls that fall through, but I don't think there is, are many calls that don't come into our office that are responded to. We have some checks and balances in that regard. We all respond to email. We're, we're all accessible to, to people. So within a very short turnaround time, I would say whenever anybody tells me they've been trying to call it, don't get an answer, I research it and generally the, the issue is they're either calling the wrong number or <laughs> the wrong person or they really just didn't get through to, to the, the call. The call didn't come in. So we really take it seriously and I think we've, you know, I think We've had great communication with a small group of CPAC parents this year. We're planning a much more robust year next year. And, um, and then person-to-person you know, -person communication, just really listening is as important as the talking. So um, that's kind of our big picture from above. Uh, and what I'd say is we'll respond to questions, but I'd also invite any of the members here to speak up about something that we didn't think about talking about, I didn't think about. Um, I was uh, very interested in the mid-cycle review, and I'm glad to hear that it sounds like it's mostly positive. Do you have an idea of when it's going to come out? It's probably going to come out tomorrow, just oh, okay. because we're so meeting just, tonight. Okay. No, I just, Great. I, I he promised it in early June, mid-June, um, but you know we really had a really, really excellent <laughs> feedback, and the feedback usually mirrors what is written down. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I'm, I'm happy for Arlington because you know they did discuss. I talked to Dr. Bodie about it. They did discuss that they really wanted to report back to others at the, the department that. Arlington has kind of found a way to be more systemically responsive to the issues that they come out and measure. And the part about that that's great is once we're doing that, we can get on to what I think is the much more important business of supporting learning. Um, and then one more question. Um, is there anything that when you came in three years ago you thought this should definitely has to get done that you still feel is still de developing, you just didn't, with all the other challenges, didn't quite get to it? Or is there the most important thing, I guess? Well, I'd love people to pipe in. One of the things c that comes to my mind, because uh, it's on my mind, is you know, looking for the very best curriculum for our students. Um, we, we have a core curriculum that we're all guided by. 
but just looking, um, making sure that we really look and see if students need alternative approaches that we find the right ones. That's okay. something that's on my mind. In the classroom? Yeah. Well, in the classroom, um, within the learning centers, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, with the <coughs> learning specialists, and in a supportive learning okay. classroom. So in all settings. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Big things that we've been really working on um, at all levels really is building the trust and communication. And while I would say that we've gone a long way and the mid cycle review really showed that, I think there's still a long way to go. We're, we're in a place where we're really trying to make sure that we're supporting all students, mm -hmm. which is obviously what all of the district's doing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult job. And without the trust and without the collaboration of families, general ed and mm -hmm. everything else, it's really, it's really an impossible job. Mm -hmm. So that's really a big piece of what we're doing and I think that's gonna have to be ongoing in any district, especially here as well. Okay. Um, I, I think I would say one word, <coughs> capacity. Um, I think what we've really focused on the last three years and I think we need to continue to focus on is building a capacity. Um, and I think, you know, certainly the work that we've done in the department and the collaboration and, and, and really bringing special education um, from a top-down approach to really a building-centered approach, um, you know, has made us grow in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, I'm hoping that we can continue that work as we move forward. So I would say at the preschool level, um, what we've tried to do, and I, and I think we have been successful and hope to continue <coughs> along those lines, is, is establishing trust and collaboration amongst our staff members, but also then in outreach to our families who are coming in. We've really, um, you know, we see ourselves as the introduction that these families have to the school district, and we wanna make it as positive an experience as possible, whether children are qualifying for special education services or not. And so to that end, when we um, sometimes will find children who we know, you know, um, are having some struggles but aren't quite fitting the criteria for an IEP, let's say, then we try to provide them with something um, and keep an eye on them and then keep communication open with the family. And, and we've gotten really good response um, with families um, along those lines. And um, for a little over a year now, we've really started with these types of groups and, and they've only expanded and met with really great success with, you know, families and the students, certainly. Jill? Um, I would say I've, I've been a clinician for so many decades that one of my passions in this department is the supported learning centers. Um, the, and I think where the focus, I think what you'll see next year is much more focus on looking at the complexity of learning in those programs and the amount of curriculum that you re really do need. Um, it's very different than a general ed experience. A lot of the teachers in the supported learning centers, if you've never done that work, um, the intensity of it is extreme. <coughs> um, it's potentially a very burnout job. It's, it's potentially high, high turnover in any districts I've ever consulted to and worked in, which is many, um, as a behavior analyst. It is the kind of work that um, I think if you haven't done that kind of work, you don't really get what it's like in that classroom. Um, but it's really, I would, I really kind of look forward to the committee kind of like, and us, like over time, just looking at that, the work that's done in those programs for these children. Um, I think that the teachers really have spoken a lot over the, the number of years I've been in the district. Um, and I think that the kind of gelling of the community of the SLCs is just even at the beginning stages for people to work across the district. For people, um, we've really worked at that programming intensely at the secondary level. It looks very different than it did even two years ago. But I think that's an area that I'm extremely interested in and in, uh, in the elementaries we have a lot of teachers, but I just have a lot of respect for those <coughs> teachers. So I just think that's an area of growth that it will be kind of moving forward to. And I just want to thank Kathleen on behalf of our team. Um, I know that we all have that in our minds, but 
the, the giving of the flowers at the CPAC, um, I haven't been to many school committee meetings where the CPAC comes in um, on their own and um, thanks Kathleen and the team building that she's done, which has been great. Um, and I think we just all want to thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you work. <laughs> I will echo that. Um, Kathleen has done an extraordinary job. These last three years, I think we have come a long way in so many areas. And she's put together a great team. Um, and she's been working with her predecessor to con continue that. But certainly in the areas of compliance, I, they, it's such, it was such a great report from the state. It was wonderful. And, but it's also about the quality of our programming for children that's just getting better and better all the time. And I, a lot of that is attributed to, to the work that she has done, both in terms of un really understanding what needs to happen, but then to be able to coalesce the people that need to help, help her s with that vision. So we're, we're definitely on the right track. Um, we really have moved a great, we've, we've moved quite further past our, where we thought we would be even a year ago in terms of a number of things. And, and uh, there was, for example, just the idea of having the two liaisons at the elementary level was Kathleen's idea, and it has worked out very well. But there's been a number of these, and we owe a debt of gratitude. Um, and at this moment, I actually also want to mention one of the things that has been um, a concern is what's going to happen this summer for transition. Uh, because our new director, Ms. Elmer, will not start until August 25th. And the plan that we have is that um, Kathleen is going to stay on as interim point five for the summer, and Ben Helfett is going to, to be sort of the acting assistant director for the other point five. So the, the office is always going to be covered. We're always going to be able to meet whatever legal requirements we have to have. And the office is open anyway all summer for any kind of communication. So that's the plan going forward for the summer. And I did want to add that the work continues with the coordinators, too. Who, um, and we have lots of plans for some systemic work to happen. And we've been in touch with Alice and Elmer. And as soon as the school year ends, for the time that we can, we've had good conversations with her. And she'll be coming again in to meet with us. And I think she's going to be a great director. I have lots of confidence in that. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the work and everything you've done. Really appreciate it. I, I just really want to say that, you know, it, it, the work I did was fine, but I couldn't do it without them. It wouldn't, it, what really, it, it's hard work every single day by everybody in the, in the di district, and it truly is. You know, everybody's working so hard. I have such respect for that. But it takes a good leader, too. Thank Sorry. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn over the next part of the meeting to Dr. Ampey. Yeah. Um, Annie and Alan, can you come up? Um, this is on the Arlington Visual Budget. It's a joint project with the town and a local company, Involution Studios. The intent <coughs> is to display it's, it. My handout's on the purple, if you want to see the motions. Um, the intent is to display financial information in an accessible, engaging format. And many of you saw the presentation that was given at town meeting in May by Annie and Ellen. Um, because of the time pressures for tonight's meeting, they're going to do a very truncated presentation, like one slide maybe, um, and then answer questions. So um, one slide. And the desire is to have the Arlington Public Schools provide additional data to further populate the AVB's website. Um, all data desired is already public record. And I've talked to Ms. Johnson. She's indicated her ability and willingness to supply data, but there may be decisions that need to be made and, and formatting and stuff. So I'd like to make two motions. Do you want me to make them now, or do you want me to make them at the end? Why don't we make them at the end? OK. So it's your show. Well, by way of introduction, uh, I'm, I'm Alan Jones. I'm one of the three vice chairs of the Finance Committee, and it's my particular responsibility to put together the eye test chart that we give to town meeting every year. And people, people do love that because it puts all of the town's finances together in one place. 
uh, but you need a good head for numbers and a magnifying glass to really get something out of it. So when Annie LaCourt, former select person, and um, our own Involution Studios, which is their offices right across the library, came with a proposal to do a uh, visualization, a web-based visualization of all of the numbers. Uh, I, I was on it like a cheap suit. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, you've all seen Arlington Visual Budget and anybody out there in uh, ACMI land, I invite you all to go to the website, which has been live for since last September. It's arlingtonvisualbudget.org, spelled exactly the way you'd expect it to be. <coughs> it's a web-based tool that creates a visual map of very complicated financial data. And it's structured so that the size of each item is proportional to the dollar amount of that item. Uh, the great thing about it is you can drill down into each one of those uh, to up to eight levels of detail to see exactly what goes into each, each piece. There's also this feature where you see $7,500 where you can type in your tax bill and go through the, the website and see exactly uh, you know, what, what part of uh, the tax bill here, for example, special education, $493 out of a $7,500 tax bill. That's been a very popular feature among taxpayers. Um, we also have data represented by uh, fiscal year. So right there in the middle uh, where the line is, that's the uh, updated numbers from the approved fiscal 2015 budget. To the left of that is the actuals for five years previous, and to the right of that's our projections for five years in the future. Um, we uh, started this out, we've got a lot of excellent response from taxpayers. Uh, I, you probably know we won the Innovation Award from the Mass Municipal Association, which has generated a lot of interest from all over the state, even all over the country. Uh, we started out um, this year focusing on the town budgets. We worked very closely with the town manager's office, in particular, assistant town manager Andrew Flanagan and analyst Mike Booten, and got a lot of detail way down many levels into the town's <coughs> budget. Where we'd like to go from here is to work with the treasurer's office to get a lot of detail on debt and investments of the funds. We'd like to work with capital planning committee to get a lot of details about the capital plans, especially how they all go together. And we'd like to work with the school department to get more details in the school budgets. Um, and that's really why we're here, to see if we can get that process started. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, members have any questions at this time? Nope. I, I have one, <laughs> and it, yeah, I'm sorry, it's the one that always shows up. Is there a cost? No. That's even better. <laughs> that even sells it uh, more. In Involution Labs has very kindly donated all the expertise to put this together, and the rest of us are volunteers. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to make two motions. I'll make them at the same time. Um, I move that this Arlington School Committee approves the idea of APS supplying additional financial data for the visual budget product, project. And second, I move to authorize the budget subcommittee to work with the Arlington Visual Budget Project and the CFO to determine what financial data to use and to make other decisions that may be necessary. Is there a second? Second. That's one motion in two parts. Yes. Thank okay. you. Uh, any discussion from the board? Dr. Bodie? Yes, I think it's a great idea. Okay. And they're going to, uh, I've been looking forward to seeing our data mm -hmm. included at this. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. No further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very We're much. all looking forward to it. Great. Right. We'll be in touch. You're top on my agenda tonight. Awesome. Okay. Uh, moving down to the next item, uh, we have the second read of the Arlington Public School District goals for 2014-2015. Dr. Bodie. Uh, thank you. There have been a, a few wordsmithing um, changes to these goals compared to what we had last time. I, if you remember, committee members were invited to give me comments, which uh, uh, several people did, and I've incorporated those comments. Some of them were very helpful. So I think we have a, a, a better, uh, better exposition of what the intent of each one of the strategies are for the district goal. So nothing has changed substantially. In fact, nothing's changed substantially, but rather um, just the wording of it. The only thing that was slightly changed, and that is the issue of um, developing uh, structured common planning time for teachers. I think that 
this next year that's going to be a combination rather than just increasing. It's going to be, I think we need to look forward for many years in terms of how we're going to develop a plan to increase it. Some of that will require a considerable amount of planning in terms of how you, you change schedules, which is no small thing. But even having said that, there's going to be an effort next year to to increase structured planning time, and I'll be able to report back to you how successful that will be as we look at our existing schedules. Some of that extra planning time will really come in the form of how we use um, early release days and perhaps pullouts of teachers within the day, which we, we've, we've always done, and we did a little bit more of that last year. It may, do, may be the only way to accomplish it. So when you have a group of teachers, say, ta teaching ninth grade English that we, we give them a, ha a morning to plan together uh, because it's very hard to, to, to put that into the schedule. So we're just going to sort of keep a, a track of the, of the ways that that happens. But other than that, nothing's changed. It's just been, you know, some commas, some, a little bit of wordsmithing with it from the last read. Any comments, concerns? Well, we had a vote, yeah. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion at this time? I move adoption of the district goals uh, for 2014-15 as written. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Unanimous vote. <coughs> uh, second read on the Arlington Public Schools 2014-2015 school calendar. Dr. Bodie. Again, we've had no changes since the first reading of this calendar. I move approval. Is there a second? Right. We'll oh, just okay. get a second in the morning. Okay, I'll second. Any discussion? Um, I'm not sure where to put this. The calendar as written doesn't satisfy the policy that we've got because or we have a meeting that, that ends, our, our 20th meeting is after the last day of school. So if we want to take that up under policy, Either that or I had a discussion with mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman prior to the meeting that we can always, uh, I think we probably should leave it to policy and go like, you know, like that. Do you have a problem uh, p passing this at this time and let policy rectify it? No. I just, Mr. Thielman. Um, school year is uh, in a broad term. So I mean, mm -hmm. the last day of school, you know, we, we are, there's faculty still, there's faculty and staff that are still here. Mm -hmm. Okay few days after yeah. so that's okay. in, I don't in, think it's a big I don't in think the it's a big past year. we've treated the last day of school as the last day of the school year but that's it's I understand it's it's blurry in it yeah. and my suggestion is that we make we don't use school year we say like from between September oh, and June or something I think like it's a that modification later of policy. yeah, 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 that, yeah that's yeah. okay between so the school fine. year as defined from September from yeah, the sep first day of uh, well, yeah. professional development to June 30th well, why don't we just say July 1st, uh, June 30th. Sure. All right, we can, I mean, we can figure it out when we get to that. Well. Oh, I just have a question about um, why did we not have November 6th as a school committee meeting? That we have two bunched up, I just don't remember why. MASC conflict. There's a con oh, conflict. Yeah, there's a. And just a small thing, February is spelled wrong in one of the places. Just a. Well, let's fix some it. Some parent is going to find that, so. <laughs> Under. Um, HSD. Yeah, HSD, high school delayed openings. It says February. Yeah, so. Spell check, Karen? <laughs> spell check. <laughs> spell check. Oh, I think schools should have correct spelling on any document going out. I oh, agree. yeah. At least yeah. we'll hear about it if we don't, I'm you sure. Try. So. <laughs> any further discussion? All those in favor with those changes? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Unanimous vote. Thank you. Okay. The finance, uh, monthly financial report, uh, our CFO is not here tonight. If we have any questions, I would ask you to direct them to Dr. Bodie. If she can't answer them, she will. If she can't, she will pass them on to uh, Diane and get back to you as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions at this time? No. Let's, I mean, just for people that are listening this evening, I'm sure they want to know where we are at the end of this year. Go right ahead. Um, you have a summary document here from uh, Diane Johnson. As you know, all through the year we've been we've been talking about a deficit this year, and 
that's exactly one of the reasons why we had to have the warrant article for town meeting in order to be able to access those stabilization monies. Um, as we get closer to the end, and this number will probably change a little bit too as we move forward, but we're getting a much tighter view of exactly what the deficit will be, and, and then there's also, the, while there's a deficit, we have covered the deficit, and I'll explain that in a second. But the amount of the deficit is a, a slightly over a million dollars, and m that is all attributed to overages and special education costs this year. And if you remember from our studies over the years, there's just there's the years of peaks and valleys, and it's just it's very hard to predict. But um, as we get bills and, and you know for our fuel bills, for example, electrical bills, as those get a little bit tighter, we'll will um, be able to get a finer number for you. What is, what is a positive direction is that the prediction about a month or so ago was 1.2, and it's actually just down closer to a million. Now, we've been able to cover this deficit by the special education stabilization account that, that we access through a voter town meeting. Um, and the, we also have um, a lab credit that we're going to be able to use this year. We don't use lab credits to build our budget, but it's <coughs> nice to know that it's possible to access some of those credits in a situation like this. And then there was a reduction of, of revolving reserve balances from prior years. Um, it has not depleted our reserves, uh, which is good. You, you, you need, we do need to have um, some reserves going into a new year. But um, it's a bet it's, we're in a better position than we thought we would be a month ago. So this is good. Ms. Seuss. Oh, I just have a few questions. Um, so what's the difference between the number that's over a million and then the negative amount of 974 um, on more. the second page? Second page. I think this is a question I'm going to have to refer to, to Diane. In fact, perhaps the best thing to do if is just to send her um, an email. And then another question, um, and this is just for background because I don't know enough. Um, the resolving reserve balances, are these from the tuition? Where, where does that, just because I don't know what, where they are well, coming from. Well, we have, um, we have a, a re special ed revolving account that is for tuition in, for a better way of saying it. So in, for some of our students, we're able to um, bill out to their sending district the cost and it's it's and so whatever tuitions we have from that go into that revolving account okay thanks Mr. Schlickman. uh will we need to make any transfers uh to uh, uh move items from line item to line item in order to get the uh, budget done at the end of the year i don't think so but i I think that is a question that we'll probably need to to take a look at, but I don't believe so. If if you if uh, Ms. Johnson thought that was going to be the case, she would have had these motions out here tonight. Mm -hmm. All set. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Well. In the superintendent's report, there's a, no, a number of things. One, the most important um, item tonight is to have a discussion with you about the decision as to whether next year we will um, do the park assessments, which Naomi was very eloquent about the, the sixth grade experience. We have some data from um, elementary experience that we'll share with you in a minute. So f sort of framing this, the way this, the state has set this up is that school districts can have a choice between doing PARC or MCAS. And then even within the PARC decision, uh, it's an all or nothing, by the way. If you choose PARC, your whole district does PARC. But within that decision, you can also <laughs> choose by school whether it's PARC online or it is PARC um, paper. This year, we piloted both in the district um, at different grade levels. 
there is a deadline that is that's coming before us, which is June, the end of the end of June. Um, if a district wants to do the park online, that is the that is the the last date that you can make this decision and be guaranteed being able to do the online, or for that matter, the paper. And the reason for that is that the state is going to be entering into contracts with the uh, service provider on this and this summer. And because it's actually fairly expensive, they want to have an, an accurate number. Now, that doesn't mean it's not possible that there might be, there might be a, an ability to do this if you made the decision later. The later date is October 1, but there's no guarantee on it. Now, as far as MCAS goes, that would be, that would remain the same. And next year, regardless of what we're doing here, 10th grade is going to be MCAS. It also, all of our alternates are going to be MCAS, and all of our science tests are MCAS. So the decision here is really about grades 3 through 8. Um, for uh, English language arts and mathematics. There is another decision we could make, which is whether we're going to do park online or paper for ninth grade, end of course tests, and 11th grade. However, um, this evening we have no recommendation on that. And in fact, there's, the, the, there's not the same uh, issues around deadlines. And, and part of the reason we don't have a recommendation on that is that there's a lot more discussion that's going on with curriculum leaders. I, 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 they've all felt that we needed the summer to think about it. And in fact, most districts are, not, are from what I've been hearing from other superintendents, are, are probably not going to do anything with the 9th and 11th next year. But so our decision this evening and is about wh where we're going to be going with um, Arlington next year. Well, the superintendent has to actually be the communicator to the state on this. Um, quite recently, the the this the interpretation of the law from both MASS attorneys and DESE attorneys is that this really needs to be a vote of the school committee. And uh, as to the direction we're we're going to go, and so I know that you've you've given you a lot of materials. I'm sure you've been reading a lot. You're you know, and, and some of you have personal experience with this. So this is sort of like the, the sort of the framework of what we're, we need to talk about this evening. And in fact, um, we probably do need a vote. Now, if you don't feel prepared to do a vote tonight, I think we may need to schedule another meeting. Well, we. Uh Dr. Party also sent out today a doodle for us to have a uh, a retreat, which it that's considered an open meeting as as such. So we can also put it at that point. But I think right at this moment we're a little bit ahead of schedule from where I thought we were going to be. If it's all right with the board, I'd like to invite the board to ask any further questions for clarification. And at that point, if we if there's a consensus to well, make a okay. decision, if not, we can po postpone. I know I have a couple of questions I need, but I'll defer to the rest of the board at this time. Does anyone else have any? Oh, can I just inter? Well, I'm not finished, actually. I'm sorry. Sorry? Um, actually, I was going to ask Laura Chesson um, if she would uh, review um, some of the pros and cons. I have to tell you, I have been personally um, back and forth myself as to which, which direction to go. Um, and there are, and really needed to sit down and actually list out the pros and cons, and you've heard from Ms. Steinitz tonight. It's, it's not um, a clear-cut decision by any means. I can say that it's probably 50-50 out there right now. I was at a meeting today with um, a lot of EDCO superintendents, and other than one, they're all pretty much going with the, the park online next year. And in fact, that is our recommendation this evening to do that. Um, I think Laura will go through our pros and cons um, as to where, why we came to that. And there is a number of them. But actually, one of the compelling things for me on this, although there's many of these, is that next year we will be held harmless. Um, the, the amount, even though we have more testing days, we're going to be shorter testing periods. Um, 
that will go along with this. I, I, I think they've made a, a mistake in having the sessions in March be so close to May if they're in fact May, March is supposed to be formative. But it's probably likely that the Board of Education is going to go along with this <coughs> the following fall. And, you know, we will have had a, a year of experience getting the results back and just taking a look at in terms of, of how <coughs> we can, you know, maybe align our curriculum a bit better, do a little bit more support. So I think that this, it's a good learning year that we can use that data from because the first year in 15, it will be held harmless in terms of accountability. We'll get the data. But in 16, we won't, we won't be. Um, so that, that is something that's no small factor in this. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's, it's part of a, a much larger picture of pros and cons. And I'll let Laura, if you would, do that. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, since the uh, uh, policies and procedures meeting, I tried to take the pros and cons and sort of divide them into certain categories to make it easier. And it's on that blue sheet of paper that should have been put at your, at your seat. Um, the first set would regarding uh, the curriculum-based considerations. <coughs> um, we have a great track record in Arlington um, is getting students to score well on the AP exams. And there are many tasks that, that you move through as you get higher and higher in the levels of park um, that are very similar in the sense that you take um, information from multiple sources and, and you put it in one writing document. There are also types of questions that are asked on the park, very similar in some ways to the uh, DDMs that were discussed tonight. For example, one of them will say which of the two of the following answers are correct. So there's not just one correct answer, there are multiple correct answers and that's because there's a number of mathematical statements of which some are equivalent. And um, so that's again very similar to our DDMs where we're looking for students to be able to find multiple right answers and to be able to con convert easily from one to another. And uh, finally, there are some tasks that a paper and pencil test just is not able to do. Um, we uh, were working with different units uh, with teachers from the Lucy Calkins program, um, particularly at the middle school level, and it's requiring students to be able to take information from audio, from visual, from written, from nonfiction, from liter literature, and put all that information together. And that is really difficult to simulate in a paper and pencil test. So it sort of speaks to the wanting to use the computer test. Um, the um, instruction based, again, that the tasks and the questions that are asked, uh, albeit not all questions are excellent, I will certainly agree to that, um, are in line with the pedagogical techniques that are required by the Common Core, more critical thinking, um, those kinds of questions. In terms of our, the technical based consideration, um, we were able to handle uh, the park. We had uh, sixth grade and uh, fifth grade uh, testing at the same time and fifth grade and eighth grade testing at the same time really did not run into any trouble with uh, technical support or bandwidth um, and in terms of devices we've already sat down and done a schedule and know that we can do that. Um, Proctor's uh, report that students had very little difficulty accessing the tools and providing answers um, I think in part to the training that we did and I don't want to um, try to contradict the young lady that was here tonight but the data on the blue sheet that you see there actually comes from her class. We did a survey of her class, um, yeah, an online survey, and all the students, uh, 80 students responded. Um, and when the students were asked, you can see there that if they were asked if it was harder or easier, um, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, you can see their responses there. Um, you can see some uh, comments that they added there about what they, why they thought something was easier or harder. Um, when you talked about the material, the um, almost resoundingly they they said yes I I've seen this material before they were honest in in several cases and said I'm not sure if I remembered it but I definitely have seen this material before um, and when we asked students if the directions were hard to understand um, the vast majority of the students said no um, or some or sometimes they were um, so when we look at that in terms of the response that we're getting um, and I have to echo what Dr. Bodie said in terms of fu future accountability. Um, it's very likely that the Department of Education is, is the Board of Education is going to approve this. Um, I, there's been a lot said, and, and I, to a certain degree, I would agree that they've offered us a very big carrot by asking us to remain harmless. 
but I'd like to look at the other flip side. If they had come and said, we want you to do this test next year, but by the way, we're gonna hold you to it just like we have every other year in terms of accountability, we wouldn't have been happy with that either. So um, while I, I agree that they probably are not being totally altruistic and, and they're held harmless, it would have been a lot worse had they said, you, you're gonna take this test and we're gonna hold you to the same standard that we had always held you to before. Um, and I, I think it gives us an opportunity to look at the actual test, not the practice test, by having our students take it um, next year. And um, I guess the, the last thing I wanna talk about is, yes, in terms of administration, it will be easier on the administrators and um, the guidance staff, but that doesn't, that doesn't make their life that easier. It also means that they're more available for students. Um, if guidance, guidance counselors are not spending 30 hours getting ready for MCAS, then they're working with students. And if administrators are not tied up counting forms and packing up boxes for UPS, then they're working with students. So while it will be easier for them, um, they will be working with students then. They're not gonna be taking a lunch break because they're not doing uh, MCAS. And, uh, and Dr. Bodhi, uh, one last point that Dr. Bodhi also alluded to is that um, when you do uh, MCAS, because of the distribution of materials and because of the way the test is administered, it, you can you blow half the day doing that. Um, once we got parked down to the point where um, we were able to um, sort of regularize it, the uh, administration of it, it's, it's about a 40 minute test and students could be in and out in an hour and, and 15 minutes. And if taking an hour and 15 minute test blows the rest of the day out of the water, then that means anytime we have a unit test the kids are taking, we're blowing the rest of the day out of the water. So while I think that in the beginning it will be hard, it, it will be harder for them to shift from one thing to another, I really feel that in the end, um, even though it's an, more days, the amount of time sitting in a testing section, session will actually be less and um, cause more, uh, minimize the disruption. Okay. At this time I would ask the members to consider clarifying questions if they need more information at the, at the moment, and then we can make a decision going forward. Anybody have any questions this time? Ms. Starks. Um, all right, I have a couple. Um, I want to better understand what's the impact to graduation? What happens to the MCAS requirement for high school graduation? Is there an equivalent park, or do those kids still have to take MCAS? Right now, they're holding the MCAS as the graduation requirement to 2017 because the law requires that the test has to be in place for a certain amount of time before it can be used for high stakes. Okay, so they're still taking MCAS. They're yes. Still taking sense okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and so that's pencil. That's still pencil and paper mm -hmm. until then. Okay. Um, and I don't. I guess I, part of me doesn't understand your recommendation, given that Dr. Bodhi said a district is all or nothing. So by recommending it for three to eight online. I assume we're oh, recommending the, 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 nine to eleven can be separated. Yeah. So you have three options. You can do just three to eight. You can do just nine. You can do just eleven, or you can do any combination thereof. But three through eight is sort of like one from column A, one from column B, one from column oh, C. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So it's so just because you not three through district eight. wide, it's right. by grade no. by no. grade thing. Okay. And my third question is: Are we going to get the information? Um, from Park next year. This year, I know no data was given to anybody, and I want to know: Are we going to get information next year from mm -hmm. the tests? Yes. Yes. Very Even much. though we're not going to be held accountable for it, we won't be used for anything. I just want to know if we're going to get it. We are going to get it. I think we're going to get it much sooner. Um, it will also will also have student growth percentiles. There, they've set up a statistical model to map. Um, some kind of equitability between between the two. Now, they have to do that because if you've got some districts doing MCAS, you got some doing right. PARC. Essentially, this is how they're doing it. If 20%, let's just say hypothetically the numbers, 20% were proficient or in some particular uh, scale on MCAS, they're mapping it into 20% that's gonna be in PARC. Okay. Not sure that there's a lot of statisticians will look at that and go. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> but but in order for equitability, you have to. Just just so, because 
even if we can't map it to MCAS, it means that we have a place to start right. the next year. And so I right. just wanted to make sure we were actually going to get their data. And one more piece of that, if actually we do better, you that that still is recorded as better. It's only it's the harmless. I think one of the things about the this is it's just, it's it's all relative, and that's one of the reasons we look at different districts and so forth. Is that we you know we we sort of compare ourselves to each other. We get a sense of where we are, and if we find that you know the comparisons are very different next year than what we've seen in the past, there's things we need to look at within uh, our curriculum and pedagogy and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so uh, lastly, this obviously, I just I want to make sure that everyone knows this. This means that if we did park, we will not do MCAS in those grades. It will mm -hmm. not be correct mm -hmm. two tests. Mm -hmm. It will just be the with one. the exception of science, because that's the um, for oh, right, the for right, the grades right, to right. take science, because okay. there's no park. But we won't do any writing. There's, the, the, there's the, writing in the performance-based assessments, but yes. Okay, but only, no only long as long part as mm. far as park, oh. not not the long. Okay, so just science. I just your recommendation is just up through the eighth grade. That's correct. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the decision is really only about three through eight, mm -hmm. and then you could do ninth grade separately, eleventh grade. What separately. What is your recommendation? Three to eight. Oh, I'm only talking about three to eight. We're okay. not. I'm making no because, recommendation okay. on nine and twelve tonight. We don't have. I just one. want to make that clear because I'm thinking. When you just said there's no double testing, mm -hmm. the high school kids would have still double test, but it's not. I right, got it. Right. Thank right, you. Right. All right. All set. I have a bunch more, but I can come back to them. Okay. About just, the technology. Just briefly, I know other states are using a different type of test. Right. Connecticut has its own. Smart a lot balanced. of people have thought that that might be actually better than Park. I'm wondering why Massachusetts didn't give us an additional option. Do you got? Do you know why that we are faced with these two choices and that's it? Oh. Well, well, we, have we talked cast. about this before. Uh, Dr. Chester is Director the chairman of Park. Of Park. Well, Dr. I, Balance is the other test. So, and the other thing I would I would bring up is is something that I've been considering and thinking about a lot lately is what we just passed tonight, which is our district goals for next year, includes Goal 44. A public forum will be held to communicate information about the Common Core Mass Standards and state assessments no later than February 2015. Mm -hmm. Thinking that we have till October, I'd like to see us conduct a public forum and get the parents mm -hmm. involved and communicate to them what park means. A lot of folks, I was at a PTO meeting last night, PTO people who are very active in their school had never even known that this was going to be a choice for the school committee this evening. Mm -hmm. So I'd really like to see us engage 4-4 before we make this call. Thanks. If you make the decision after June 30th, then there is no guarantee of the online. I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman. Okay. Uh, not so much questions, but some observations. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 first of all, the MCAS is an obsolete test. Right. Uh, the biggest benefactor of the MCAS test is the United Parcel Service, <laughs> which uh, benefits from shipping crates of paper from Dover, New Hampshire to every school in the Commonwealth and back again. Um, the, there are lots of questions. On, uh, there are some really valid things in the MCAS, and there's a lot of stuff that really isn't uh, giving us data back that's very good at all. The, lo the long comp is, is almost useless statistically because there's low, uh, very little variance in it and really isn't telling you much. Um, so that the argument that Park isn't particularly well aligned to the writing of the Common Core, uh, MCAS is worse because it really doesn't. It really doesn't measure writing well. It does do a good job of doing open response questions. Uh, Park's strength is, is uh, open response and more higher order thinking. Um, teachers are more comfortable with MCAS because they've been teaching for it for a long time. So their teaching has become aligned to the testing instrument, not necessarily to the standards. They've become aligned <coughs> to teaching well against the instrument. So that an unfamiliarity with a new instrument is not necessarily a measure that we're, the instrument is off, it's that the current MCAS is offline to the, uh, to the, to the new um, Common Core curriculum. Um, 
next year's assessment data is going to be unreliable whichever way we go because a lot of the things we depend upon is having everybody in the state answering the same set of questions. And that will not happen. And because we are sitting here making a park versus MCAS decision, just like a lot of other districts, my sense is there is something, and I don't know what it is, but there's something in common among districts who are choosing to go to park that is different in nature than the uh, districts who are choosing to stay with MCAS. Some un unmeasurable factor is differentiating. So there's going to be a difference in the, school the schools using PARC and the schools using MCAS, which is going to further complicate the ability to compare across two instruments. Um, it, there, there is a no-win situation here. There are problems with both. And be, me, I am a consumer of this data. I look at subscores, I look at growth scores. I live for those two components of this. And as far as I'm concerned, one thing is happening here is that Mitchell Chester is asking us to trust him uh, in that the data we're going to get is going to be good, reliable, robust, and do all the things we want it to do. And we've not seen uh, a decimal point of data come out from this. And as far as I'm concerned, having faith in Mitchell Chester is sort of like having faith in Edward Mojica in, in, in the 11th inning looking to hold the, the game together. Uh, it, it's, it, that's the biggest part that disturbs me about making this decision is that we're putting more faith in Mitch, Mitchell Chester than Ms. Mitchell Chester has earned. Uh, but uh, I, I think that this is a reasonable way to go, uh, I, but only if we're going to go to the online testing. And the thing that you said on the, our subcommittee meeting is that you are fully confident that we have the technology, the bandwidth, in order to be able to do this and do this well. Uh, and if that is the instance, I, I think that what, from what I've seen of this, the assessment is maybe not perfectly aligned, but neither is MCAS. It's probably more authentic, and uh, and I think it's worth getting into this a little faster than others because, uh, as with MCAS, the scores rose as people became familiar with it, right. and I think that what's going to happen is a is a year of more familiarity, is is going to help us. And even if the state does not eventually go park, if Charlie Baker wins or if the winds of uh, the state board of education change and all of a sudden uh, Park is not favored in Massachusetts, uh, wherever we're going to go, a new MCAS, which would be online, or even if we go to the Smarter Balanced, or if we go someplace else, it's going to be more Park computer-like than what we're doing right now. So that there'll, there's no good answer. And you know, I can sit here and make an argument for staying with MCAS, because it's the, the, I know what I'm going to get in data, and, and I'm happy with that. And I can make the argument for going forward with Park, with park because the, the glimmers of hope within this are that it's going to be better aligned and it's going to be more focused on higher order thinking. So um, it, it's a tough decision. I do think that it's right for this district to go with the uh, computer park. Um. I don't, I also don't have exactly questions. I didn't get your information until mm -hmm. we sat down here today, but I've gone through the survey mm -hmm. that the um, DESE mm -hmm. provided for students who took the online test. Unfortunately, they didn't survey the kids who took the written test, so the only data we have mm -hmm. is from the online test. So we have to make, I'm making assumptions about the test which maybe it's actually just the online bit, but I can't compare. Um, but there were a number of things that really concerned me. Um, most of them fall into the online part of the math exam. 11% um, of the students could not understand the directions, all the directions read by the person giving them. Students, 13% almost always and 25% most of the time could not understand directions for questions on this test. Um, and when I look, just looking quickly at some of your stats, we're not so far from these numbers that were reported for mm. tens of thousands of kids. Um, from looking 
when they look at the online test, they say many students have little or no access to computers at home with eight to nine percent only a couple times a month, four percent having no access. I'm worried about how we want to have a test that's <coughs> testing achievement. We don't want to have a test that's testing children's familiarity with computers. Mm -hmm. And I question whether we're, we're there yet. Um, there were significant numbers of problems with the test. 46% of the students taking the math test had problems with the computer during the test. 44% um, of the math students would prefer to take the math test on paper. Um, we didn't ask that question. I would have liked to know that question, but I think the fact that a student came in here with 50%. Um, we did ask them if it was easier or harder to take the test on the computer. Okay. Right, yeah. but we didn't ask whether we wanted, whether they wanted to take the, take the test on paper or That's not, true. and I think the fact that the student came in with 50 <coughs> signatures from her mm. class, which can't, you know, the clusters aren't that big, can't have, I mean, that's half the cluster, or, or a little bit less than half the cluster. That's, that's a lot of <coughs> um, kids. Um, from the test administrator survey, 39% didn't feel the instructions covered all the materials necessary to take the test. A lot of, they also, the way they assessed whether students needed extra time, the numbers were really hard to parse out, but the sense I got was around a third of the kids taking the test needed extra time, and many of them needed more than 20 minutes. And I'm concerned that test stress has been a big problem and continues to be a big problem, and that all of these things to me suggest a test that's going to be more stressful to both our students and also our parents. Our parents, I mean, just when we started talking about computer-based tests coming last year, people started freaking. And we haven't done the background work that we need to do to prepare our parents and prepare our students so that they know and feel confident going into it that they have mastered everything. Um, and I'm especially concerned when I look at all of these things and when I think about our high need students, and I'm talking special needs, English language learners, students from low income homes, all of the cluster, all of these things seem more likely to be happening to them. I mean, needing more time, having problems finishing a test, having problems understanding directions, all of these things seem to be happening more with this group. And that's the group that I'm especially concerned about and the group that I really want to be able to follow good growth numbers. I'm, con I'm really concerned about the problems with directions because that's, that's not so much English. That's, I mean, that's not so much computer. That's English and it's how it's phrased. And I'm worried that they haven't got the bugs worked out and that we're asking our students to go in and take a test which isn't 100% doable. And that's not a good testing situation it, and it's not good psychologically for our kids and I feel that I'm not saying what we're going to do two years into the future I'm just looking at it this year I don't feel comfortable with our students taking park and especially online um, and that's I'm happy to hear counter arguments to my thought process but that's where I was coming from I do. I have a few questions. The, you know, one of the most important things to uh, make any testing scheme work is that um, there's alignment between what we're doing in the classroom and what's being tested, and there's buy-in by the teachers and understanding by teachers and staff and administrators and department heads that. Um, we're gonna shift what we do in the curriculum, we're gonna shift what we do in the classroom so that uh, our students are prepared to take, uh, prepared for the test and that the assessment is, is authentic. The assessment is authentic of the, of the learning that's taking place. So what, I'm, what I wanna know about is, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, and I've just found in my own experience anyway, maybe I'm projecting too much but, uh, tonight, but <clears throat> um, uh, alignment between everybody who's going to implement a new 
a new test, new curriculum, whatever it is, is critical. So I want to know to what extent there have been co and conversations between the leadership of the district, the department heads, the principals, maybe even the teachers about this new program. Um, I, there's been numerous conversations between the department heads and, and myself um, and the math coaches, as you heard tonight. Um, I, I think that people don't think the test is perfect, but they feel that it's sufficiently um, tested at this point because it was actually piloted in some districts last year. There were some schools in the country that did it yeah. last year, pieces <clears throat> of it. Um, I think they're heartened by the fact that when we interviewed or we surveyed 80 kids who didn't have to respond one way or another, 72 said, yes, I've seen this material in my class. I might not have remembered all of it, but I've seen it um, in sixth grade. And that's only one year into the Common Core. Will we find that there will be things that we haven't covered? Absolutely. And I think the same thing happened in MCAS. I remember the first couple years that we gave MCAS, we found that there were whole issues of things that we didn't cover but we really didn't get the real handle on what we didn't cover and how we didn't and how we may not have covered it until we started to look at that data. It wasn't until we may have covered this topic in math and this topic in math, but what we didn't do is look at the interconnectedness of those two things, that it, everything we taught was in isolation. So when a student had to use multiple skills to solve the same problem, they were not doing well. And because we were able to analyze those MCAS questions, we changed how we taught in the classroom. <coughs> so while I think that um, teachers are, are you know, in not completely perfect in their alignment and certainly in their uh, pedagogical styles and instruction, I think that this will, will start us down the road where we begin to collect data to find out where those things are. And just like there were, as Dr. Bodhi, I think, or somebody alluded to tonight in the beginning, uh, actually it was Ms. Hansen, in the beginning, the MCAS had a lot of problems, but it got better because people took the test, they got lots and lots of data about what was good and what was bad. And to this date in MCAS, there are questions that they test out every year. And without uh, large amounts of data, you don't. You, there's no way to improve the test. Among the department heads and the, and the principals, has there been a conversation about um, how they're going to shift the the, the 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 direction of their staffs to to prepare for the park? Uh, we we provided yeah we provided um, training for those teachers whose uh, classes were taking the park. We actually provided training for the students. We had uh, people come in and do practice tests with them so they were familiar with it. Um, I think that one of the reasons you're seeing on this blue sheet such positive experiences, and that's what I viewed when I saw it, was because this came out of uh, Joanna Bunn's class and she prepared her students. Her students were prepared, they felt comfortable. So, um, you know, from, from what I hear from on the ground, from the math coaches, from the literacy specialists that are working in the building, the vast majority of our students, grades three through eight, particularly grades three and through five, but also in six, um, are, are using technology on a regular basis, and they're comfortable with that. As a matter of fact, there's probably going to be an insurrection at the middle school next year when all those students from the Thompson come there and say, where's my iPad? Um, and I also expect that the um, 122 students that were in cluster 610 that had one-to-one -one iPads this year are also going to have a shockaroo when they get to seventh grade. And, and as a matter of fact, they keep asking me how they can come to school committee and, and uh, bring their case forward. <laughs> so so to, to answer your question, do we have it perfectly? No. Well, there will have to be, that's one of our cons, that we will have to re you know, train people. But I don't think it's insurmountable. And we saw that we just didn't have the level of support, we expected it to be a bloodbath, and it just wasn't that. It wasn't. <coughs> a bloodbath, I mean, terms pushback of the technology. from principals? Oh, okay. Well, in terms of the kids in the classroom, I expected to have kids oh. crying. I expected to have kids not taking it seriously. I expected to have, you know, it just wasn't like that. It wasn't. Um, so what, what if, so I am, I, am, I am undecided on this. That's, that's <coughs> the problem tonight. Um, <coughs> And so, uh, and part of the reason I'm undecided is just I, I, I don't feel like we have enough information, you know. And I, I take the heart what Paul said is that we're, we're there's a desire to do the park because the commissioner of education uh, says it's a good test, and 
And I was at a meeting today with uh, DESI uh, people, uh, <coughs> uh, statewide uh, accountability and assistance mm -hmm. council that I sit on. And no, so they're all saying good things about park to me because I said I got to vote tonight on this. <coughs> so, you know, they, but they work at the, the um, mm -hmm. Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So, um, I, I, there's a part. There's a part of this. When if we vote to adopt park, it's a. It's a. There's a leap of faith. There's a. There's a. There's a. There's a leap of yes, faith. there is. And in fact, that was when I said I had been between the two. One, my first was the survey, and also information that we learned a couple months ago that we would. A simple thing. We would not know how the students did comparatively on the online version versus the paper. And that data has never been given to us and I asked specifically the person who runs Park at Desi and he said, we're not gonna have it and yes, you are gonna have to make that decision without that information. So you're absolutely correct, there's gonna be a lot of things that we have to take um, on a little bit of a leap of faith. Some of the data that you read I was concerned about too, particularly the math, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. but it, it was the number of students that did not feel that they, the technology got in the way. They fully admit that the, uh, the, all of the, the, that particular tool was not working well, and that's actually what I've heard more than once, that that is a major focus in terms of the revision of the, the park for next year to fix that equ equation. Um, Calculator. So that, that will improve. I think the questions probably will improve because it's going to be very interesting. The people who analyze this, they're going to have the data on the paper versus online. Um, but like Laura, I, w I was in schools when the first MCAS came in and the, the, it was, it led a lot of improvement. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't great and it wasn't necessarily aligned to what we're doing. But on the other hand, what has always been true of these, uh, these assessments is that they have changed what we do in schools. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think that there's been more positives from that than negatives. In fact, significantly more positives because there are students that, you know, 20 years ago were not given the same kind of supports. If they just didn't get it, they didn't get it. And, and I think that has just absolutely been revolutionary in how we've, we have approached education in this state and actually in this country. So yes, I see lots of problems with it. And as I said, sort of back and forth. But um, I think I would rather get the data, however flawed it might be, in terms of how we do on it and work with that data to see how we can do better. Um, yeah, so I mentioned to my kids today that there, we might be doing a test that would take them nine to 11 days. <laughs> and they, they, they were about to mutiny from the family. <laughs> they were gonna leave. Um, I actually didn't know that the test is shorter for each session, so that, that's actually comforting to know. I mean, I was thinking nine full days, 11 full mm, no, days. No, 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 no. So that, that part's good. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I feel torn too. Um, like Mr. Slickman, I feel like we have mm. no good option. So that MCAS is not aligned with Common Core, of course, it wasn't intended to be. This seems imperfectly in line with the Common Core. The numbers I see, even your internal numbers, don't seem good enough. So 28% said that it's harder because of technical issues. You know, it's over 30% of students who sort of had trouble with it. And similarly, almost 30%, um, so 17, uh, 27 kids, said the directions were um, sometimes or always hard to understand. And that just seems really, it feels like this is a, a not really a well-developed test yet and that wouldn't it be great for other districts to be the guinea pigs and get a better test? And then when we come in, hey, it's, it's much better. So it, it just seems like, you, you know, we need districts to potentially, if this is a test we're going to use, which I, I guess is probable but not guaranteed, we need districts to test out to make the test questions better. But I'm not yet convinced that we should be that district because well, if they're that seriously flawed. Okay. Mm. When she finishes, I get my shot. Okay. Before we second, second round. Um, 
So, so I just feel torn, and I'm just worried about the quality of the tests now, and just wonder if, if next year feels like it's going to be a wash no matter what. We either have a sort of a not a great test, or or a test that's not aligned to the Common Core. It just feels like we're we have no way of winning next year. Um, so. Two things, uh, and I'm glad Mr. Pierce brought this up. We have a goal. Mm -hmm. We brought that goal forward. Without belaboring it, we had an incident this past week and a half on communication. Mm -hmm. Is it a risk to wait till October? Yes. Um, data coming in, uh, we're going to hear this data whether we take the test or not statewide. As far as the MCAS, I taught during that time. Teachers actually had input for about five or six years of what worked and what didn't work, and then for some bizarre reason, Today, teachers can't even look at the test because they kept, th I think they kept finding issues wrong with the test mm -hmm. or questions in the test. Mm -hmm. It is a much better test today than it was. Mm -hmm. It doesn't deal with the common core. I agree with that. For all the reasons that have been said, but in my mind, and I'm going to be up front right now, I am not going to vote forward to go for the electronic for the June date. I want to wait till the October, October one. I will risk mainly based on what Mr. Pierce brought up in our uh, goals, uh, I feel strongly on that, the commitment to the community and to go forward on that. Now, if those of us, on, if we're not ready to vote and we need more beyond statements, uh, and I just made mine, I know I mm. violated my own rule about asking questions. <laughs> Ms. Starks. All right. Um, I have uh, administered MCAS for five years. I did not administer PARC, although I had several students who took PARC. Um, they weren't, I wasn't the homeroom teacher who got chosen, so I didn't. Um, but I also have to tell you that if I asked my students these same questions about MCAS, mm -hmm. you would get the same percentage answers, okay? I have kids who don't understand the directions to MCAS, and they don't understand the questions MCAS is asking them, which is why they get the questions wrong. They have, you know, um, there are just a, a ton of things. I've talked to the teachers who did administer MCAS and PARC. Um, we've had lots of faculty meeting time. Um, the people who administer PARC said yes, there were some glitches in the technology, but they kind of expected that. Actually, they were all shocked at the fact that there weren't major glitches. Like it was never, it never just, it never stopped working. They were able to do it. So, and that is, I think the case, you know, we see a lot of things even with MCAS, you know, glitches even in paper tests. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna just remind ourselves that when you ask kids, <laughs> you get kid answers, mm -hmm. okay? And the kids, are still gonna tell you that they don't wanna take these tests no matter what. And you know what, I wish we didn't necessarily have to administer them. Mm -hmm. So that being said, you know, I, I, you know, and I've been going back and forth as well. I was initially absolutely anti-PARC. Mm -hmm. um, I am not because I have gone to a presentation from Chelmsford, a presentation from Framingham. I've gone to anything and everything mm -hmm. that the MASC has been able to hold for us to go to. Um, and I think that um, right now, I I'm still kind of, I don't really know. I think that it's probably better to move forward than to go backwards, which is I think kind of where MCAS is going. I do want everyone to know that MCAS is aligned with Common Core. It absolutely is this year, and next year, it will test Common Core. I'm a math teacher, I know that, I, I know what the questions were. Um, the Common Core is in there, so um, mm -hmm. they are. Now, is it as good of a test? No, MCAS is not as good of a test of Common Core. They're still asking mm -hmm. rote memorization mm -hmm. questions that I don't think are really the way we wanna move education mm -hmm. forward. But um, that being said, I still have some questions because when I heard from Burlington um, on their cost estimates, when I heard from Framingham on their cost estimates, they both said that they needed to add hundreds of thousands of dollars to their technology budgets in order to do MCAT, to do PARC testing. And I don't 
understand, and so I need much more explanation of how do we possibly have the technology, the hardware, the infrastructure. They all said that they needed like large numbers of IT staff to pull all this off. They're intending and to I do the test see... at the same time. Right, that's exactly what They're no. all going to take No, the... they are not. That's what my no. the former director. No, in Framingham, director... they are doing one grade a day. Okay, well, the one former director at the Burlington, the IT guy at Burlington told me it was their intent that everybody was going to take it at one time. That's why they were putting it well, in They're still not going to do it all in the same day. Well, they were looking to buy. They were looking to have an instrument, and using this to have the instrument for every single student in the district. That was their intent, and no, using this. I so, went. I spoke I'm, to both of them. Okay. I spoke to the superintendents. I spoke to this to the technology people in depth, and I asked them in depth questions. How are you doing this? How is the, what are those expenses? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now Burlington did test 2,000 students this year. They are one of the biggest online tests that yep. they did this year. They didn't all do it the same day, the same time. I didn't say that. They're looking to have an instrument for every single student. They're using this as a way to purchase mm. instruments for everyone. No, they're doing they one to one. Not, not at the same time. Burlington. I didn't say the same time. Okay. One -one. He mean, no. He means. He means they, they want one-to-one -one, uh, devices. devices. But they already are, and that's not what they were talking okay. about. That wasn't part of the the, the cost was okay. three was we're getting broken off. out different. I ways. apologize. I took us off. Hmm. I would like to have a motion put on the table. I want to understand. I want to hear how, if your rec the recommendation is to go online, how we are going to test six grades in the days that we have, and it's not going to cost us. They were both quoted as close to half a million dollars. Dr. I, I'm not, I can't tell you how they came up with their numbers. I can tell you how we came up with our numbers. And we sat down and we looked at the number of devices that we had to have in each building in order to be able to do that. And we said, what's missing? And what we're missing was keyboards. Now, I don't know what they're using for keyboards, but we were using- They also bought keyboards. Okay, mm -hmm. what we are using is, our, is a, uh, a device that allows you to plug in a very cheap keyboard through a device into the iPads. Yep. And so you, the savings is, pro so we're estimating because we're only gonna test one grade at a time in each building and because of all the iPads we already have in the elementary schools, we're, it's able, we're able to do it for about $30,000. But that's because I'm using a much cheaper solution, I think, than they probably were, were going to do. Um, we need those keyboards anyway to begin to teach keyboarding in second and third grade in the elementary schools. Um, and so I, I can't tell you how they got theirs. I can only tell you how we got ours. They also may not be testing with a caching server. They may be testing what's called live in the sense that they're pulling up, sending the, question, the request for the question up. And then when the student gets the question, sending the answer back up, they may be doing that. If you do that, you can only test about 200 students a day with the bandwidth that we have. But we've already, our IT staff is telling me that we can test 2,000 students a day um, with the bandwidth that we currently have by using a technique that's called caching service, where you basically bring the test down, and at the end of the day when the students finish testing, it sends the answers back up. Um, I know that in other uh, costs were the fact that you have to run a piece of software so that nothing else is on running on the iPad at the same time. So it's it's uh, like 20 bucks a pop for each device to lock it um, so that it only runs the test. Okay, it was um, it, it, there was no else. there were no there was no cost for that this year. So if there's a cost for that, that is not something that Park has communicated. Okay, there was no co there was that. no cost for that this year. Um, there's a cost for that. There was a cost for the keyboards, the stands, but they figured out a way to use something that was pretty cheap that I thought was yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, it's a dollar. It's a dollar um, piece. And um, then they said that the other problem was that it took, took them literally weeks to line up and make sure that all of all the software and all of the hardware devices were ready to go um, and that they had to they had to be, you know, kind of sequestered. They couldn't be used on a day-to-day -day basis because they had to be used for the testing. I, I just didn't have that issue. We had major, we did, we had uh, several days worth of work in the DCL labs at the middle school to make sure that they had the right version of Java on there. And once we got that settled, there were, there were no more problems after that. Um, we have one person in the district that that went around and, and set up the iPads for the, so that they would be locked down so that they couldn't get into any other applications. 
Um, but that was setting up TestNav, and that was, you know, he, he was able to do that in very short order. So, And how um, many did we test this year? We tested grades 6 and 8 online at the middle school. Um, All two, of 6 and 8? No, two classes in each. And we tested um, Dallin at the at the fifth grade level. Okay, so this is a huge ramp up. We're going from like a couple hundred students to thousands. And and that's in a what year. right. That's why I sat with the IT staff and we talked about this long and hard. This was not a decision we made lightly. Okay. Okay. I'd like to put a motion on the table and we can continue discussing. No, no, I, I want to ask a clarifying question. What, if the school committee does what Bill is suggesting, which is not make a decision until October, till September, what does that do for your planning for the year? Well, if, if we don't have a decision, it's hard, it's hard to say. We can put in for park. Um, now, the problem might be, well, if you make no decision, it <coughs> passes the default. Um, if you <coughs> decide park mm -hmm. and it's not possible to do it then your default is MCAS mm -hmm. but my understanding I thought you said that the the only the guarantee is is electronic in June mm -hmm. there's a maybe guarantee a maybe get electronic but we could still do paper in, in October am I wrong possibly not it's, it's not clear because of the contract oh. they're getting this summer and can I also just say that the, the complaints that we had about the directions at Thompson and um, and at Bishop were actually greater. The, my, no, no, those okay, are paper. I just want to make sure that my concern is the communication with the with our goal is to communicate assessment changes. We are changing an assessment. That's my. I'm, I'm, Parker's so, over here for me. Right. I, so, I've got so mixed feelings, plus and minus. I want the instant feedback. I think that's a wonderful thing in park for us, for budget reasons, for educational reasons, and all that aspect of it. And I accept there is still, but Mr. Pierce brought it up. I think it's a valid, for me, it's going to drive my decision, and it has nothing to do with the, the mechanics of park. Okay, but you need to know that it's about communicating. It's not about asking for, it's not about getting mm -hmm. feedback mm -hmm. or input. It's about communicating what's going on, and that's different. But I guess what I heard this past week and what I believe is communication is not me sitting here dictating what is going to be done. I have to listen. I may still make a decision contrary to what I listen to, but I have to give an, I, I, I want to, that's where I am. So let me just, um, so, so I'm wondering, we, you know, today is June 12th. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible for the school committee uh, to make a decision to do more research and have a subcommittee meet and make a decision sometime in the month of June. We have a meeting that's on the calendar, I think, for the, and I'm not sure, no, we don't, okay? Yeah. But, but it's possible to find, it's possible to find another meeting date, to have a subcommittee do some, a deeper dive on this and then have a, we a have vote a later in the month. The superintendent put out a doodle today for, for a yeah, retreat meeting before the end of the month. But so it mm -hmm. could happen then if it. I can't make any of those dates. dates. There's only three dates There's on only there. three dates. But we, we didn't have, uh, we only had two people respond, and there's also well, not yeah. any agreement on the date. I haven't had yeah. a chance to. We could put a meeting on uh, that, that Thursday, uh, the fourth Thursday. I leave that to the committee. The suggestion is to have uh, two weeks from tonight another school committee mm -hmm. meeting. It would probably be directed for this purpose only. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, because I think this is a critical, this is a big decision, and um, Cindy makes a very good point about communicating. We're, you know, if this is a state mandate. The test, MCAS is a state mandate. Park is, is, is likely to be a state mandate. There's only so much dialogue you, you can yeah. have about a state mandate. You have to figure out mm -hmm. what's going to be best for teaching and learning based on the information you have, period. And if, if we could get two more weeks to do some study, mm -hmm. we, could, we could possibly make a decision. I, I would help, it would be good for me to do that additional research. But I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm one guy here. So let's let's here, be so. clear. Mm -hmm. The state mandate maybe will be in September 16. Maybe. Well, yeah, yeah, but I'm just talking about the. I'm just talking I about the, the communication piece. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's communicating. Cindy's right. Mr. Pierce, then Mr. Schlick. It it depends on mm -hmm. how you define the word is. Is you know to communicate <laughs> um, to me means uh, not to dictate, but rather to listen and understand. That's what communicate means to me. And um, what we don't know from state mandates are how our 
particular Arlington students react to stress and anxiety in the classroom. And I think we heard tonight from the special ed leaders and we've heard all throughout the year that there's a particular attention now and I think we put that in our goals as well for the emotional and social well-being of our students. That's another one of our goals that we're supposed to be paying attention to. And we're not paying attention to that goal by choosing a high stakes test like this. I'm sorry. Just putting it off one year make that okay. Yeah. Okay. difference. Okay, Mr. Schlickman. We'll okay, okay. Uh, uh, several things have swum by here. Uh, first of all, directions being unclear on, on the park. It's the first time anybody's ever done it. And the fact is, is if we are actually going to be doing it for real, people have administered it before, and the, there'll be opportunities to practice tests so people become familiar with, with, with the testing instrument itself. Secondly, uh, the anxiety issue. Um, I, 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 I monitored MCAS testing I, uh, for the past 12 years. I was an MCAS test coordinator. You're putting that paper in front of the kids. That's a, that's a stressful environment as well. Uh, and whether or not the computer testing test creates some level of stress. I see the, uh, uh, the paper and pencil test, which is such a foreign element to normal classroom practice to be even more of a stressor. Uh, a, a, an interactive computer uh, test will probably be, for more students, a less stressful component because this is a generation that's used to going and doing things and responding to computers than they are to multiple choice paper, paper and pencil tests. Um, I think the issue of communication is an important one, but I also think that as a district we need to make a decision and I don't think that it's fair to anyone, either our teachers or our administration or our students, to punt this and leave this till September. Because at this point we're, we are preparing for next year, we're going to be putting in orders for the equipment we need, um, and I think teachers starting in day one should know where we're going. So I would very strongly urge us to meet in two weeks. So I would make a motion that the school committee meet in two weeks for the purpose of deciding this. Is there second. a second? Any further discussion on that, the motion itself? So let's just be clear. It's, it's not just me. I think it's a bit more specific. Meet and decide. Meet for the purpose of deciding this. So we're going to meet on the, uh, on the 26th, 26th of June mm -hmm. at 6.30 yes. mm -hmm. p.m. in this room for mm -hmm. the purpose of deciding mm -hmm. and any other matters at the superintendent. And, and that's a regu regularly scheduled yeah. meeting anyway. So we'd be blowing off a regularly scheduled meeting if we don't meet. Yeah, so, but, then we, but, mm -hmm. I, but I think other matters can be put on the agenda yeah. with yeah. the secretary. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I, don't, I think we should mm -hmm. just... Yeah. I think, I think we have a responsibility okay. to make this decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, on the motion. On the motion. Actually, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but one reason not to make the decision now is because it's such a dynamic, changing situation. You know, we have states that are deciding not to do it, that were once part of it. We have New York State is sort of on the fence of it, on it right now. It's possible that we'll know a lot more in September and October. Well, about, I would say this, well, you know, it'll be just, we know excuse now. me. No. Excuse me. So this is, I guess this, is, this, is, motion this right is about the moment. motion of whether we're going to make a decision in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So we, one thing that'll But our decision could be we're waiting. But for the, the decision second. in two weeks, one thing I would, I would point out is that in two weeks, we'll probably have more information how, on how other districts have voted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Edco yeah, districts. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm interested in that. I'm interested to see the discussion. And we should ask the superintendent to... To, to get that for us. Yeah, I mean, I you think... You can just ask MASC. It's been yeah, all over fine. the And there's a list. Okay. But not okay. for the next two, we have been involved. There's two more weeks. Yeah. But this gives us... Can the, we please, excuse me. <clears throat> if you've got something you want to say, please raise your hand and speak to the motion at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Yes. Um, was the phrasing of the motion that we have to make a decision or... For the purpose of making a decision. Okay, does that mean that we have to? Because what it means if we a motion that, that, be, a I'm motion just trying to make... That will be on the agenda, making a decision. A, we, a motion will probably be brought forward. We'll vote it up or down. Mm -hmm. I'll make the mo I'll prepare a motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm saying is I'm trying to understand if... I think we should have a meeting. I think we should discuss it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not positive we're going to come to a conclusion. We may not. Well, if we, if, if, we don't I, vote a mo if we don't vote a motion, we have made a decision. Right. Right. But at this point, we're, we're by, by doing nothing, we're making a decision. Fine. You know? Anything okay. further on the motion? Well, I would say this. A motion will be on the table mm -hmm. to adopt park. 
Mm -hmm. It will either pass or fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a weird yeah. shooting the horse. Mm -hmm. So that's it'll pass or fail. Okay. Yeah. And if it fails, we could in theory come back in September. And you can meet with and yes. Public. So yes, we can always. Right. All those in favor yeah. of having Doesn't give us a, a school time. committee meeting on June 26th. Sixth. <clears throat> Say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Nope. No, I'm opposed. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> yes, I'm opposed. I oppose. Oh, say no. You got to yell out. No. <laughs> in here, is yeah, my yeah. Only in here. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Okay. You're not gonna I, come. I. I'm not coming. No, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm opposed to the meeting. Six-one vote. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Doctor Bodie, the rest of your report. <laughs> You've got exactly two and a half seconds. No, man, go right Wait, ahead. Wait, well, are, are we going to try to have some kind of, I mean, here's the problem. If we go out and ask parents, no, no, one, no, most no, of them no, don't know no, what this is, no, that's not no. it. That's and two, they, of course, are going to be against it as soon as No, I'm not. It, it's hard to that explain. wasn't my point. Was at, it wasn't asking for permission from the community to do one thing or I another. I understand that. That wasn't my ask. I my agree. ask was to have a, a public forum as our goal state oh, I absolutely way before February 15. Oh, oh we and sure I, yeah. I, Absolutely, we I, can do that. I, well, but ideally before we make a decision like this. That's, I'm that's sorry. That's how I, I agree. But, um, but, but I think that it, we've sufficiently warned the public that this is on the agenda. Oh, to our five people no. who are watching. Well, it, people uh, and the uh, people on TV. And Excuse I think me. Yeah. The chair has lost control. <laughs> and the chair wants control. On another <laughs> issue, I'm not going to entertain any more discussion on this issue mm -hmm. at this moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just kind of address no, his point? No, deal with him wrong. later. Thank you. Go. <laughs> Okay. Enrollment. <laughs> Enrollment's um, good. I A statement. To, well, yes. We, um, we have uh, right now, if you look at our total, what our total difference will be next year as of this moment in time compared to where we were in October 1 numbers, we will be up 178 students. I suspect that we will go over 200 by the end of the summer. Um, our number of uh, kindergarten students, 511. This year is 469. We, we, now, when I when we when I set the numbers for the kindergartens back a couple weeks ago, they were pretty even throughout all of the schools. Maybe one, a plus or minus one or two, but they were really even across the district. That has really started to change. And, mo and actually most significantly at Stratton. Mm -hmm. Stratton numbers had gotten up to 28, and we also know we have some students will be included next year, a little bit more than they even were this past year. So um, it was, imp I know you have received a lot of email of, of around mm -hmm. this issue. Um, <coughs> and, and I know you've responded that these are all preliminary numbers. As we go along, we'll see what's happening. So what we're, what we'll try to do even in the next couple of weeks and see if we can even these off a little bit more, but I, it's possible, it was hard to say yet, where we'll go if we need another kindergarten. We clearly need one up at, at Stratton. However, Stratton's kindergartens will be a little bit smaller than in the other, other uh, the ones in the district. So it would, it, that's just the way it's gonna be. We can't have kindergartens starting at 28 plus students that are gonna be included as well. So that's why um, I confirmed those numbers today and the, the decision was pretty clear. So I just wanted to let you know where we stand with that. Now, of those numbers, that 178 I mentioned to you, 142 are in the elementary. Okay? All right. Um, we want to, just a quick comments from the two of you on graduation and I just want to give a, um, a congratulations <coughs> to the orchestra band and chorus, fantastic. boys chorus at um, Audison, if I can, as soon as I can find my piece of paper. But do you want the, to say? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, um, uh, graduation was a beautiful day. Um, the student speakers were very um, inspiring. I want to thank the chair for the brevity of his uh, <laughs> of his words. And? Um, and? And? 
And it was compelling we, and, and, and no. uh, motivating. <laughs> uh, uh, wow. We had, a, we had a discussion of whose would be shorter. Yes. Mine was I owe pages. him a dollar. <laughs> Mine was three pages with a 48 font. Hers was one page with a short font. That's right. how I got the dollar. Right. But other than that. Other than that, um, it was a wonderful day, and they actually set a record for a short graduation of one hour and 40 minutes, which I'm thinking that many parents very much appreciated. Uh, <laughs> The students were phenomenal. They were. Uh, I want to thank not only Dr. Chesson, uh, but uh, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we all processed in our regalia, and uh, the students were were just something special. Uh, and it, it was a pleasure. I truly enjoyed being the chair and passing out. I had the uh, ability to tease a couple of the students that I knew. I told a couple they had blank diplomas, and they panicked for <laughs> about two seconds till they saw it. But it was a wonderful day. It was, truly was wonderful weather. The weather was just exciting. Yeah. Uh, well, I just want to, again, another um, congratulations to the music department, this time at the Odyssey Middle School. They participated in this great East Music Festival that was up in New Hampshire, which is a big musical festival for middle school um, uh, groups. So the, boy, the band and the boys' chorus received gold medals, and the orchestra had a platinum. And that platinum was with 98 out of 100 points. So they did very, very well. So just congratulations to all of them. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you. Moving on to the consent, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee re so requests. <coughs> which of that the item will be considered in a normal sequence. Mm. Approval of warrant, warrant number 14168, dated May 22, 2014, in the amount of $723,396.45. Approval of draft minutes, mm -hmm. none. Approval of APS Sister City Student Exchange Trip to Japan, July 1 through 13, 2014. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Mm -hmm. Hearing no opposition, this is a unanimous vote. Mm -hmm. Subcommittee and liaison reports, policies and procedures. Mr. Pierce. Thank you. We met uh, again this week, and uh, we have before you for second reading our uh, regular school committee meetings, uh, file revision of BEA. And um, I understand what Dr. Allison Ampey was saying in terms of the first um, sentence there uh, where we say during each school year. I'd be fine with um, amending that to between September and June as a possibility or mm -mm. no? No. Uh, our school year could, actually a school year is July 1 to June 30, so we could actually do it anytime we want, but uh, hmm. uh, the, uh, if you do it September to, to June and we want to do a, August. an August meeting, we right. can't. So I, I, I think the vaguity, uh, the, the, the vague nature of the school year allows us the flexibility of scheduling our 20 meetings okay. yeah, as I, needed. Don't yeah. touch it. Yeah, so we did, we, uh, I, would, I would move that uh, we second. adopt BEA. I, I second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. Mm. And uh, we also took up uh, the issue of fingerprinting. Um, we've been told that uh, mm -hmm. we have to have uh, a new quarry policy in effect uh, for next year, as well as a new background checks policy. And so it was suggested to us uh, by MASE and by DESE was to uh, discard our current uh, ADDA policies, of which there are four, and to adopt uh, the uh, <coughs> the ones, their blue sheets in, in front of you tonight on background checks and uh, it talks about um, what we've talked about here in this meeting, uh, the fingerprinting of, of uh, school personnel and the, and the fees associated with that um, and, and how to request uh, not only Corey information but CHRI information which is criminal history records information um, and then ADDA slash R is the Cori policy, which is updated to meet the new, the new uh, laws. So this is first read. I don't know when we'll, maybe if we meet, yeah, on the 26th, yeah, we can first, get to it on second read. Yeah. Sounds good. Anything further? Um, we talked about PARC for NMCAS. <laughs> we got educated on it, so we had a, we had a little bit of a, 
a leg uh, up here uh, tonight. We had uh, Ms. Hansen and, and uh, Dr. Chesson and, and Dr. Bodie talk to us a lot about that. But we also talked about, and we had uh, four parents come, I think uh, five, um, there was a couple, uh, talking to us about kindergarten uh, and entry age. We've, we've been through this before as a committee since I've been on it. Um, they're talking to us and they'd like to open up the conversation and communication about um, kindergarten entry age. We have a policy on that about age five as of September 1, age six for first grade as of September 1. And so they're really like three, three choices. You know, you could, you could leave the policies as is. We could change um, the dates of starting age for either kindergarten or first or both. And so I think um, some, some further study is going to be done on that. We're going to have some ongoing com communication with those parents who are interested on that. So there's no recommendation at this time? Nope. Thank you. Did you have a question? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I just have a question. Is, um, I know some of the parents want some flexibility, or do any of these districts have the kind of flexibility that the parents are asking for, or are they pretty definite this is the date? Um, they did, and I, I'm sorry, in our packets, we don't have what they provided us at the meeting, I don't think. Uh, but they did have examples of districts that had, Who have that kind um, of thing. Okay. like, gray buffers Got areas. It. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank All you. Set? Mm. Budget. Ms. Starks? Um, we met yesterday. Uh, we are working on things, so we probably will uh, have some things for uh, the fall. Um, I don't think we didn't have anything that uh, was coming forward today. We talked about the visual uh, budgeting stuff coming to us. Um, and I just wanted to put in my plug. Um, my husband and I worked last blast. Mm -hmm. at the end of the day and it was fun to see them all drag their butts in there by 11 o'clock and then <laughs> uh, we were there until one and then I could barely see straight anymore so we went home that we were on the first shift but um, I also wanted to put in a plug um, because last year I can do it because my son will be a senior next year so um, if you want to have fun if you really if you know any if you know seniors or if anybody knows that they uh, want to especially especially need people from the one to five shift which is you know like but the nice thing is that now that graduation's on Saturday, oh, you don't, at least you don't have to get up and go to work, and, which yeah. was really hard. I worked at I worked the one to five shift two years when Morgan was in the high school um, when before I right right before I uh, when I went back to work I had to take the day off so because oh. uh, you can't. I I appreciate that, but <laughs> just a, a point: all the juniors that support the graduation. We're taking the SATs that day too. Yeah. So they were running a little ragged. So there's a plus and minus to having it on the Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But I noticed it was on, it's on Saturday again right. next year. All set. Yep. Great. Uh, community relations, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we met on um, May 27th, uh, when most of our conversation was about communicating with the community, uh, particularly with regard to web presence and dashboard. Uh, the discussion is in the draft minutes that are at your table tonight. Uh, in addition, there's some correspondence in the packet here uh, regarding Nagokako. Uh, we have an article from the Kyoto Shinbun, uh, which I'm sure you've all read. I poured over uh, uh, Very clear. Rieko was kind of, yeah, Rie <laughs> Rieko was kind enough to do a translation. And we have a letter on record that was received by Matthew Janger, the principal of Arlington High School, which is a request from Nishito Kuni High School, uh, which is the school that has been sending high school senior high school students to us as part of the program. The kids who come in tend to be a mix of middle and high school students. And the students who have been here, I think we've had four students so far who have done a year at Arlington High. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they have all been uh, students at this high school, and uh, they'd like it to formalize the relationship uh, but, uh, and, and, and have a sister school relationship between Arlington High School and their high school. Now, this is sort of an important thing for next year in that uh, unless the mayoral election changes the uh, prevailing winds in the city government, we'll need some sort of an official agency for us to have a relationship with when we receive students next year. So that uh, I'd like to ask that we place this on the agenda for uh, the next meeting of the school committee to authorize this uh, um, 
sister school relationship. You're talking June 26th? Yeah. Would you forward the relevant information to? Uh, it's, it's here, so. That, that's yeah. sufficient. Yeah. yeah. You all set with that? Okay. Yeah. And uh, okay. both Sonoe in uh, Japan and uh, Sue Scheffler, in, uh, uh, who has coordinated it on the volunteer side for us, are fully on board with uh, taking the step to formalize the relationship between our right. high and their high school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Special study group, and superintendent's evaluation, no report. Uh, the chair. Uh, what about curriculum? I apologize. Curriculum instruction and assessment curriculum. accountability, Dr. Allison Abbey. I apologize. No, no report, but do you? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to be left out. I apologize. No, no, no. Do you want no us to take up any discussion about Park and MCAS in I, between now think, and two weeks? <laughs> I think I think if the committee can meet, I think it should happen. That would yes. be great. Okay. Thank then you. Then we'll do that. That's why Thank I wanted you. to talk. So who's on that committee? So let's yeah. Yes. You're doing the in-depth study yeah. and the research. Okay, no, good. I think we should. I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as going paperless, uh, well, we haven't met yet. Sir. Novus agenda was the uh, one that was selected to do a pilot. Uh, the support staff have had. Uh, they correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Fitzgerald. Have you started any of the uh, the training? No. They was they were. Next week, so maybe at the next meeting we'll have a little bit more okay. in-depth report on that. Uh, secretary's report. There's no secretary's report. I thought we got rid of that. We got yeah, rid of it. it. Okay, so we awesome. weren't sure. Excellent. And it's okay. certainly not me. And it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Executive session. Don't pick on the secretary. We, we will. We will be uh, exiting for ex executive session. We will be coming out uh, to take a vote on some some of the issues. Uh, that may be discussed in executive session, contractual issues. Executive session uh, to conduct strategy, strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which, may, if held in open meeting, may have a detrimental effect. To discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, if in open meeting, may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of a public body and the chair so declares. We will be uh, <coughs> discussing and vote to extend and modify the Arlington Education Association MOA on sending non-resident children to Arlington Public Schools. We will be voting and discussing the uh, AEA Unit A Evaluation Contract Provision MOA dated 524-213. Voting and discussion, uh, the Traffic Supervisors AFSME Council 93 Local 680 MOA June 2014. Ex executive session to vote on above contracts. Mm -hmm. 